Hi everyone and welcome to week one of Introduction to Logic. If you haven't already watched the welcome video that I posted along with the syllabus, please go back and watch the welcome video before you watch this video for week one. This first week of the course is sort of a preliminary week. We're going to talk about the nature of arguments. All of logic has to deal with arguments. So this first week we'll talk about what arguments are, different types of arguments, and some of the key terms involved in evaluating different kinds of arguments. So without further ado, let's dive in to talk about arguments. So what is an argument in logic? An argument is a series of statements, some of which the premises provide support for another statement, the conclusion. This is really important. Um, an argument in ordinary speech can mean like a disagreement or a, 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 literally an argument is what we call it, but an argument in logic is a formal uh, structure that has to do with a series of statements providing support for some other statement, the conclusion. So those are the two terms that are relevant to an argument, premises, the reasons that are given in an argument and the conclusion, the statement that's claimed to follow from those premises. So if an argument is made of premises, it's important to think about what statements are in the, in the first place. A statement has a truth value. It's something that's either true or false. Now, this is really important. A statement can be true or false, whether or not we know that the statement is true or false. So some, some statements are statements because they are true or false, even if we don't know that they're true or false. So at the bottom of the screen here, I have some examples of different kinds of statements. All of these are statements. Some are true, some are false. Some presumably we don't know whether they're true or false. So let's run through these examples. Some potatoes are grown in Idaho. That's true, but it's a statement because it's either true or false. It has a truth value. The next statement is two plus two equals five. Now that is a false statement, but it is a statement because it's either true or false. It has a truth value. This happens to be a false statement, but it's still a statement. So it's really important that you understand that a statement doesn't have to be true in order to be a statement. You can have a false statement. The next statement is interesting. God exists. That's either true or false. Presumably we don't know whether it's true or false, but it is a statement because it has a truth value. That is either true or it's false. Uh, if we don't know which. That doesn't mean it's not a statement. It just means we don't know its truth value. And I have three more examples for you at the bottom of the screen. The atomic number of gold is 79. Now, you may or may not have known whether that's true. This happens to be true, but it's a, it's a, a, a statement because it, ha it has a truth value. It's either true or it's false. Dolphins are fish. That happens to be false. Dolphins aren't fish. They're mammals. But it's a statement because it has a truth value. It has a truth, truth value of false in this, in this case. And the last one, humans have an eternal soul. Again, presumably, we don't know whether that's true or false. It is either true or it's false. It's one or the other, but we don't know which, presumably. But it's still a statement because it has a truth value, just an unknown truth value. So an argument is made up of statements. Let's talk about some things that are not statements, by contrast. On the screen, you'll see some examples of things that are not statements. Questions, for example, are not statements. And you have an example here, where is the bathroom? That doesn't have a truth value. It's neither true nor false, so it's not a statement. Proposals, something like, let's go get a cup of coffee, that's neither true nor false, so it's not a statement. Might be a good idea, but it's not a statement. Suggestions, for example, I suggest you do your logic homework, which I do suggest you do your logic homework, but that's not a statement. It doesn't have a truth value. That sentence here, I suggest you do your logic homework is neither true nor false. Commands, something like go to your room, something a parent might say to a child, um, that is neither true nor false, so it's not a statement. Might be a necessary consequence, but it's not, it's not a statement. And something like exclamations, uh, here I have an example, awesome that's neither true nor false, um, so not a statement. So again, statements are things that have truth values. They're either true or they're false, whether or not we know they're true or false, and there are lots of types of sentences in English that are not statements. So right off the bat, arguments have to be made up of statements. The premises in an argument have to be, a, have to be statements, and the conclusion of an argument has to be a statement in order for an argument to count as an argument in logic. On the screen here, I have an example of an argument. This is a very simple argument. Um, arguments can be very short or they can be very long. Um, every argument has at least one premise and a conclusion. Some arguments have two or three or four premises. Some arguments can have a very large number of premises, very large number of reasons involved in drawing the conclusion. But every argument has one and only one conclusion. It's also possible for a set of reasons to yield more than one conclusion, but really you have two separate arguments at that point. So here's a very simple example of an argument. There are two premises and one conclusion. 
I hope it's kind of a humorous argument, makes you laugh a little bit. All wizards know magic. That's a premise or a reason. Harry Potter is a wizard. Therefore, Harry Potter knows magic. That conclusion follows by necessity from those reasons. Given those reasons, that conclusion has to follow. So this is an argument with two premises and a conclusion. And there are lots of different kinds of arguments with different structures, different, different patterns of reasoning, different patterns of inference in them. But they all have premises, some number of reasons, and one conclusion that follows from those reasons. There are lots of things in English that are not arguments. Uh, your textbook, the Hurley Logic textbook, lists a few. One category of things that are not arguments are what the textbook calls simple non-inferential passages. Now, the word non-inferential can be a little intimidating. An inference is the relationship between the premises and the conclusion of an argument. You infer the conclusion from the premises. So simple non-inferential passages are sort of short passages where there's no inference, where there's no reasons being provided for a, for a conclusion. And again, that's the thing I want you to keep in mind about the definition of an argument, that every argument has an attempt to provide reasons for some sort of conclusion. If that's not what's going on, you have no argument there, even if structurally some passages in English kind of look like arguments, but if there's not an attempt to provide reasons for a conclusion, you still have no argument. So various things count as what the textbook calls simple non-inferential passages. A warning, for example, is not an argument. If it's, you know, don't go, don't go in that burning barn because it's on fire, that's not an argument. There's no attempt to provide a reason for some conclusion there. A piece of advice, not an argument, again, because there's no attempt to provide reasons for it. Um, you can have a piece of advice as a conclusion of an argument, but a piece of advice on its own is not, uh, not an argument. A mere statement of belief or opinion, if you say, I believe God exists, or I believe the Golden Gate Bridge is orange, you know, those, are not, um, those aren't arguments. There's no attempt to provide reasons for anything. So merely stating what you believe or stating your opinion is not an argument. The textbook has a strange category here called loosely associated statements. If you just have a bunch of random statements where there's no inferential relationship, no attempt to use some of those reasons to provide evidence for, for another statement. In other words, if there are no premises and a conclusion, there's no argument. And a report, if you're merely reporting on some event or reporting some facts, listing facts, for example, kind of like a television reporter would do in a, in, a, uh, in a news report, that's not an argument because there's no attempt to provide reasons for a conclusion. So the textbook lumps all of these together and calls them simple non-inferential passages. But the important thing here is that they're non-inferential. That means there's no inferential relationship between premises or reasons and the conclusion that's claimed to follow from those reasons. There are other things that are not arguments. Uh, the textbook goes into some more detail on this. Expository passages. That basically means you're developing or expanding on a main idea, kind of like paragraph writing 101. If you have a topic sentence and you're expanding in a, on that idea later in the paragraph, that's not an argument because you're not providing reasons for some sort of conclusion, some evidence that something is true. Illustrations, if you're merely giving examples of some principle, um, either concrete examples or abstract examples, that's not an argument because the illustrations or the examples aren't being used to provide evidence for some conclusion. Although if you're providing, if you are providing um, uh, examples for some general conclusion that you're going to draw, that can be an argument, but merely giving examples of some principle on its own is not an argument. Explanations, this is a very broad term, but if you're merely explaining something, shedding light on some event, explaining why something is the case, explaining why or how something has occurred, that's not an argument because you're not trying to prove that something has, has occurred. You're not trying to draw a conclusion. You're trying to explain why something is the case. And that's not an argument because you're not trying to provide evidence for a conclusion that you're drawing. The last category of things that the textbook lists as not an argument are conditional statements. Now, conditional statements have the form, if something, then something else. Um, if the water is cold, then I'll go swimming. Now, a conditional statement on its own is a statement. It's either true or false. It can be true that if the water is cold, you won't go swimming or you will go swimming. That whole sentence there, the if-then statement, is a statement. It's either true or false. But again, an argument has to be made up of more than one statement. 
there has to be premises and a conclusion. There have to be some attempt to provide reasons in one, prem, in one statement for a conclusion in a separate statement. So a conditional statement can actually be part of an argument. Some argument forms use conditional statements as their premises or as the conclusion, but an if-then statement on its own is not an argument. It's just a single, single statement. Even if the, the antecedent and the, and the consequent, the two parts that make up a conditional statement themselves are statements, an overall conditional statement is still just a single single statement. Therefore, it's not an argument. Um, there are plenty of examples of these in the textbook. Uh, in fact, by the end of the video, we're going to dive in and look at some specific examples of these. Um, you're going to get lots of practice on these for your homework. Um, logic is very formal and mathematical. In fact, learning logic is more like doing math than like reading ordinary, ordinary language, ordinary English. Um, but this first week is going to be mostly an ordinary language because I want to get you up to speed on the nature of arguments and how they relate to ordinary language so we can abstract and do some formal methods for evaluating arguments throughout the rest of the course. But you're going to get lots of practice reading passages in, the, in English in the textbook that are, that are arguments or not arguments, and you'll have to identify which, if, which kind of passages are not, uh, not arguments if you encounter a passage that's not an argument. That's going to be part of what you're going to have to do for homework this week. Let's move on. There are two broad categories of arguments. All arguments fall into one of these two broad categories. They're either deductive arguments or inductive arguments. And there's a very simple distinction between these two types of arguments. In a deductive argument, the conclusion is intended to follow from the premises by necessity. That means in a deductive argument, if it's a good deductive argument, if the premises are true, the conclusion is, is supposed to follow by necessity. That conclusion absolutely 100% with no ambiguity has to be true if those premises are true and if the reasoning is sound inside the argument. Um, so that's a deductive argument, an argument that relies on necessary reasoning. By contrast, an inductive argument is an argument in which the conclusion is intended to follow from the premises by probability or by likelihood. In other words, if someone is giving an inductive argument, they give you some reasons and they draw a conclusion, but they're not claiming that, they're, that their conclusion has to follow with absolute necessity from the premises. They're claiming that the premises or the reasons make the conclusion likely to be true or probably to be true. So the difference between deductive arguments and inductive arguments has to do with the strength of the conclusion, how strongly the conclusion follows from the reasons or how weakly the conclusion follows, follows from the reasons, the strength of the inference involved, whether the reasoning is, is supposed to be one of necessity or of probability or likelihood. There are lots of types of deductive arguments and the textbook makes some attempt to classify the different types of deductive arguments that you're likely to encounter, some of which you're going to encounter in this class and some of which you'll encounter out there in the world. Uh, I think some of these will be obvious and some of these uh, might be a little mysterious. Don't let the terminology uh, bog you down too much here. We're going to look at some of these types of arguments in more detail later in the class, but I want to give you an overview of, of these different kinds of deductive arguments that the textbook lists and talk about what makes them deductive in the first place. I should say also that the vast majority of arguments that we're going to look at in this logic course are deductive arguments in which the conclusion is supposed to follow by necessity. You're more likely to encounter inductive reasoning in, say, a critical thinking class in, in, here at the community college or, or at a university you go to, um, uh, a course on practical reasoning, for example. But here in logic class, we're going to focus mainly on deductive arguments because formal logic has to do with deductive arguments. So let's look at some of these. Arguments based on mathematics. If the conclusion of the argument follows because of mathematical reasoning, if there's some sort of mathematical calculation involved that yields the conclusion, obviously that's going to be deductive because mathematical reasoning is, is reasoning based on necessity. You know, as a super simple example, two plus two equals four. If you treat that as an argument, two plus two being something like a premise and four being something like the conclusion, that conclusion has to follow by necessity. There's no other right answer to two plus two than four. And that makes the reasoning deductive. The reasoning and mathematical reasoning is always deductive reasoning. Arguments based on definition. If the argument hinges entirely on the definition of the words involved, then that's going to be a deductive argument because if the conclusion just follows from the premises based on the meaning of the words, then that meaning of the word is, is by definition, by, by necessity. So the conclusion would follow from the premises by necessity. So arguments that rely on the definition of the words involved are always deductive arguments. 
The book also lists several types of syllogisms. Now, don't worry too much about the term syllogism. We're going to talk about syllogisms later in the class. But syllogisms are basically short two-premise arguments where a single conclusion is drawn from two premises. And there are three main types of these that you're likely to encounter, what are called categorical syllogisms that deal with categorical relationships. And you can usually identify, identify these by, by the words all or some in the argument. You'll usually have a premise or a conclusion that has the words uh, all or some in, in, in the uh, premises, which indicate that the, the argument is establishing you know, what objects go in which types of categories relationships. So for an example, we have uh, one here. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I do a, a podcast on Star Trek and philosophy. So I use a Star Trek example here. All Klingons are warriors. Lieutenant Worf from Star Trek The Next Generation is a Klingon. Therefore, Lieutenant Worf is a warrior. And I think you can see that if those two premises are true, if it's true that all Klingons are warriors and it's true that Lieutenant Worf is a Klingon, it would have to be true by necessity that Lieutenant Worf would have to be a warrior. So the reasoning involved in these categorical syllogisms is always deductive reasoning. The conclusion is always supposed to follow by necessity. Now, there can be good arguments and bad arguments, good arguments in which the conclusion really does follow from those premises and bad arguments in which the conclusion doesn't actually follow from the premises. But the idea is that the intention behind the argument is that the, the conclusion is supposed to follow from the reasons that are given in the argument. The next category here are hypothetical syllogisms. Hypothetical is basically a fancy name for an if-then statement. You know, I think this makes sense. Uh, you know, if you're saying if something were the case, that's hypothetical reasoning. So hypothetical reasoning always has to do with these if-then conditional statements. So a hypothetical syllogism, one of its premises has an if-then statement as one of its premises. So here's an example of a hypothetical syllogism. If God exists, then humans have a soul. I don't know whether that's true or false, but it is either true or false. That's a statement, it's a conditional statement. So the first premise, if God exists, then humans have a soul. The second premise, God exists. Again, that could be true, could be false, I don't know. But if those two premises are true, that conclusion that I have listed here, therefore humans have a soul, would have to be true if those two premises are true, given the nature of the reasoning involved. And I think you can see this, that any argument that has this form, if A then B, A is true, therefore B has to be true, that conclusion is always going to follow no matter what statements you plug in there. So that conclusion follows by necessity from those premises, and, the, and that's what makes it a deductive argument. The conclusion is claimed to follow by necessity. And the last type of syllogism we're going to look at here under deductive arguments is called a disjunctive syllogism. Uh, again, don't worry too much about the terminology. We're going to look at this later in the class. But a disjunct is, is an either or statement, either A or B, either one thing or something else. So a disjunctive syllogism is a syllogism that has an either or statement as one of its premises. So for example, here on the screen, either God exists or everything is permitted. That's actually a quote from a philosopher named Jean-Paul Sartre. I thought it'd be fun to include, get you a little substantive philosophy while you're learning logic. So either God exists or everything is permitted. God does not exist, the second premise. Again, might be true, might be false, I don't know. But if those two premises are true, therefore the conclusion would have to, would have to follow that everything is permitted. And again, the important thing here is that the reasoning is reasoning based on necessity, that an author of an argument like this is claiming that that conclusion follows by necessity from the reasons that are given, not, not mere probability, not mere likelihood, but absolute necessity given the reasoning involved. And of course, there can be good arguments or bad arguments where the conclusion actually does follow or the conclusion doesn't actually follow, but the intention is that the conclusion follows by necessity. There are other types of deductive arguments. In fact, there are lots and lots of types of deductive arguments, but the textbook is giving some very common examples of types of deductive arguments that you're going to encounter both in this logic class and out in the wild. So by contrast, let's look at types of inductive arguments. There are lots more types of inductive arguments, to be honest, than there are deductive arguments, and the textbook lists several common ones. Predictions are inductive. And I think if you think about each of these types of inductive arguments, you'll understand pretty intuitively why these types of arguments are inductive and not deductive. If someone is making a prediction about the future, if they're saying such and such happened, therefore such and such will probably happen, 
The reasoning there is always probabilistic or always um, always one of likelihood. You know, you can, no one can predict the future with absolute certainty. There's always something that could intervene and prevent the prevent the the predicted event from occurring. So predictions, no matter how how accurate of a prediction you make, you're still making a prediction that is is merely likely to be true. You never know with absolute certainty what might happen. So any prediction about the future whatsoever deals with inductive reasoning. It's like predicting the weather. If a weather, if a weather reporter says, you know, there's an, a 90% chance of rain tomorrow based on the evidence that they have, the meteorological evidence, all the evidence might give you strong reason for thinking that it actually will rain tomorrow, but that doesn't 100% with absolute uncertainty mean that it has to rain tomorrow. So um, predictions about the future are always like weather predictions. No matter how, how much evidence you have about what will unfold in the future, you can always imagine something that would intervene and prevent that outcome from occurring. So predictions are always inductive. They're always deal with probability and likelihood. Arguments from analogy, an analogy are comparing two different things. You know, two, these two fruits are similar to each other because they're both fruits, that kind of thing. So anything that relies on a comparison or a similarity between two, between two different things, though arguments that rely on that are always going to be inductive. And I think this is, is pretty intuitive as well. For any two objects, you can always find similarities between them and you can always find differences between them. So when your conclusion hinges on a comparison between two different things, you might have a good analogy where the comparison is, is a strong one and holds and the two things in question are similar in the relevant degree, but there are always gonna be some differences as well. So any argument that relies on analogy are at best going to give you sort of good reason for thinking that the conclusion is true, but not prove that the conclusion is true with absolute certainty. Generalizations. Now, generalizations have a, a, have a pretty sp a specific, precise definition in, in logic. Generalizations mean you're reasoning from particular examples to some sort of general principle. For example, if you live out in an apartment complex and you look out on the driveway and you see, you know, five cars that all have four wheels, you can say, oh, that car has four wheels, this car has four wheels, that car has four wheels, that car has four wheels, therefore, and here's the generalization, therefore all cars have four wheels. I think you can see that if you look around and you count up the number of cars you see out in the world, the vast majority of them have four wheels, but that doesn't prove with absolute necessity that all cars have to have four wheels. So any, any type of reasoning that goes from particular examples to some general conclusion or general principle uh, is, is gonna be inductive by, by definition. It's gonna deal with, with probabilistic and, and probabilistic reasoning or reasoning based on, on likelihood, no matter how much evidence you get in, in particular examples. Arguments based on signs. I always thought this was a, a kind of a funky term that the textbook uses. Signs here mean written or visual messages. So if someone writes something down, like if you were in my, my physical classroom and I said, homework is due on Sunday, that would give you lots of reason for thinking homework is actually due on Sunday. But that doesn't prove it with necessity. I could be lying, I could have made a mistake, I could have written the wrong day, maybe you misread it. Um, so any, any argument that hinges on written communication or visual communication is going to be uh, a, an inductive argument because written messages, um, give, you know, again, they give you reason for thinking that some conclusion is true, but doesn't prove that conclusion with necessity. You can always imagine a situation in which you misread the message or the author is lying or they made a mistake or something like that. And the last category of inductive arguments that the textbook gives are causal inferences, not casual. Make sure you catch this as causal inferences, not casual inferences. Very easy to mistake to make with your, with your eyes. Causal inferences are arguments that reason from a cause to its likely effect or from some effect to that effect's likely causes. And I think you can see why this is inductive. If you say if something is the way it is and you start imagining what could the, the causes of this effect be, you can always imagine more than one cause that would produce any given effect. And likewise, if you imagine some event and try to predict what would follow, what effects follow from that, that event, um, in other words, what effects follow from a cause, you can always imagine more than one effect following from a given set of, set of causes. 
So causal inferences, arguments that rely on the relationship between some cause and some effect or vice versa are always going to be inductive arguments. And again, there, there are more types of inductive arguments, but I want, what I want you to understand is this broad distinction between deductive arguments and inductive arguments. In deductive arguments, the conclusion is supposed to follow with absolute necessity from the premises, whether or not the conclusion actually follows, you're going to get a bad deductive argument. But in an inductive argument, the conclusion is supposed to follow only by necessity or by likelihood. The reasons given in an inductive argument are not intended to prove the conclusion with absolute certainty. What you'll see sometimes out there in the wild is that someone will be giving an inductive argument. They'll make some sort of prediction about the future. They'll draw some analogy. They'll talk about causal relationships, but they'll speak about their conclusion as if the reasons they've given really prove their conclusion with absolute certainty. And I think it's important for you to, to recognize instances like this out in the wild. If someone says, you know, I'm gonna give you a prediction about the future, therefore you have to accept my conclusion with absolute certainty your mind should identify that as an inductive argument where the conclusion doesn't, doesn't actually follow by necessity. At best, it's likely or probably true. And uh, someone could claim that their argument uh, is a deductive argument, but really be giving something like an inductive argument using one of these kinds of argument forms that you'll see in the textbook. So be on the lookout for that. But most importantly, I just want you right now to understand this broad distinction between deductive arguments and inductive arguments. And as you dive in to do your homework for the week, I want you to get lots of practice making distinctions between deductive and inductive arguments in the, in the textbook exercises and identifying specific types of deductive arguments and specific types of inductive arguments based on the textbook reading and based on, on the lecture here and based on the examples that you see in the textbook. Now I want to give a, a very quick overview of some of the key terms that are used to evaluate both of these kinds of arguments. Again, in this logic class, we're going to talk mainly about deductive arguments. So this first slide that I'm going to show here is going to be a bit more important than the next slide, but I, I included both uh, sets of terms for, for completion's sake, even if we're not going to spend much time on inductive arguments. When you're evaluating a deductive argument, and again, just as a reminder, a deductive ar argument is an argument in which the conclusion is supposed to follow from the premises by logical necessity. If the premises are true, the conclusion is supposed to be true with absolute necessity. The first term involved in, in evaluating a deductive argument is validity. And this is a very technical term. An argument is valid if the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises, whether or not the premises are actually true. Another way to put this is that if you assume that the premises are true, even if you have false premises, if you start out by assuming that they're true, if it turns out that the conclusion follows from those premises, if you assume the premises are true, again, with absolute necessity, then that argument is called a valid deductive argument. Now, a valid argument doesn't mean that, that, that you have a good argument yet, because you can have an argument in which the conclusion follows from the premises, but the premises aren't actually true. And obviously that wouldn't give you enough reason to accept the conclusion. Uh, validity evaluates the logical reasoning, the logical link or the tie between the premises and the conclusion. So given the truth of the premises, if those premises force the conclusion to be true, whether or not the premises are actually true, that means the logical reasoning in, internal to the argument is good logical reasoning and the argument is, is valid. But again, that doesn't mean you still have a good argument. For a good argument, you not only have to have good reasoning, but the premises or the reasons that are given actually have to be true. And that's what this second term on the screen uh, evaluates. A sound argument, first of all, has to be valid. So the reasoning has to be correct. And all of the premises, the reasons that are given in the argument actually have to be true. And if you have both of those things, if an argument is valid, in other words, if the reasoning is correct inside the argument and all of the premises or the reasons are actually true, that means you absolutely with 100% logical certainty have to accept the conclusion. The conclusion is, is necessarily true in that case. So a sound argument is a good deductive argument. But I want you to keep these two terms straight. Validity evaluates the internal reasoning of the argument, the logical tie between the premises and the conclusion, whether or not the premises are actually true. But the way you actually do this in practice is you start out by saying, well, what if the premises were true? Would the conclusion have to follow by necessity? And if that turns out to be the case, you've got a valid argument. But a valid argument doesn't automatically make a good deductive argument. A good deductive argument is a sound deductive argument. 
And for a good deductive argument, two things have to be the case. You have to have a valid argument. In other words, the, the logical link between the premises and the conclusion is a good logical link. In other words, the conclusion really does follow from the premises and all the premises are actually true. And that is what is a sound deductive argument or a good deductive argument. So that's deductive arguments. Um, most of what we're going to be talking about in this logic class is validity, evaluating the validity of deductive arguments, showing that conclusions follow from a given set of premises with various formal methods that you're going to learn about. Methods that don't worry too much about the terminology, you haven't learned them yet, but things like the truth table method, the proof method, and there's different types of deductive arguments. There's propositional logic and predicate logic for different handling different types of statements in natural language converted into a logical, logical form, into a formal structure, all of which has to do with evaluating the validity of arguments. Um, so again, this is going to be the locus of our class, talking about whether arguments are valid, whether a you know, conclusion follows from a given set of reasons in formal logic. Um, and obviously, you know, arguments are about things, you know, premises that are real premises are about things in the world that are either true or false. So in a great many arguments, you can't actually decide whether the arguments are sound or not, unless you actually know whether the premises are true. And that takes often some empirical research or some science or some uh, historical evidence or something that, uh, that actually tells you about the truth of the premises. But that's a little outside the domain of a logic class. A logic class in some narrow sense, like the class we have, deals with the validity of arguments, showing that logically a, a conclusion follows from a given set of reasons or from a given set of premises. So that's deductive arguments. For completion's sake, I want to talk about inductive arguments as well. There are two parallel terms for evaluating inductive arguments, strength and cogency. Again, don't worry too much about the terminology here. It's important that you know them, but there's not going to be a test on this or anything like that because we're focusing mainly on deductive arguments and logical validity in this logic class. A strong inductive argument is one in which the conclusion likely follows from the premises. Again, whether or not the premises are actually true. So if you start out by assuming the premises are true, if those premises or reasons give you likely reason for thinking that the conclusion is true or thinking that the conclusion is probably true, then you have a strong inductive argument. Again, that means that the re internal reasoning of the argument is good reasoning. But the difference between deductive arguments and inductive arguments, again, just as a reminder, is that inductive arguments deal with, with probabilistic reasoning or reasoning based on likelihood. So in a strong inductive argument, if you assume that those premises or the reasons are actually true, that gives you good reason for thinking, for thinking that the conclusion is probably true or likely true, but doesn't prove that the conclusion absolutely has to be true with any necessity. But that's still not a good inductive argument. A good inductive argument has to have two things. In other words, a cogent inductive argument. I've never really liked this term cogency. I thought it's a little overly technical and um, kind of a distraction from what really matters. But in a, in a cogent inductive argument, in other words, a good inductive argument, two things have to be the case. The argument has to be strong. That means that if you do actually assume that the premises are true, the conclusion is likely true or probably true. And all of those reasons actually have to be true. If both of those things hold, if the argument is strong, in other words, if the premises give you reason for thinking that the conclusion is probably true or likely to be true, and the premises are actually true, that means you know that the conclusion is probably true or likely to be true, not that it absolutely has to be true. So again, I want you to spend a little time on this in your homework. In fact, there are some homework exercises that drill you on this, give you some examples and force you to identify whether the uh, argument is strong or cogent and whatnot. Um, the opposite of strength is, is, uh, is weakness, by the way. I think the, if, we, if we back up and look at these terms, I think their opposites are, are clear. The opposite of a valid argument is an invalid argument. If an argument is not sound, it's unsound. I think those terms are pretty clear. The opposite of a, of a strong inductive argument would be a weak inductive argument, and the opposite of a cogent argument would be an uncogent inductive argument. So with that said, let's dive in and look at some examples. I'm going to take a little break, make a cut in this video, and transfer over to look at some examples. I'll be back in just a minute. It'll be instantaneous for you, but I'll be back in just a minute, and we'll look at a bunch of examples together and uh, get some practice on these different concepts before you dive in and do your homework for the week. Okay, hi everyone, I am back and we are going to look at many, many examples of everything we have talked about in the first part of this video. Without further ado, let's dive in. 
So as I said at the beginning of the video, arguments are made up of statements. Statements are pieces of language that are either true or false. That means they have a truth value. So let's look at some examples. Inside each of these boxes is something that's either a statement or not a statement. Did you know that whales are the descendants of land mammals? So that's not a statement, it's a question. So questions are neither true nor false. This sentence does not have a truth value. That means this sentence is not a statement. Here we have another question. What is seven plus three? So again, this sentence does not have a truth value. That means the sentence is not a statement. Try again. That's an exclamation or a command, but it doesn't have a truth value. It's neither true nor false. That means this sentence is not a statement. Hurry up and finish your tuna sandwich. Again, it's something more like a command or a suggestion. Does not have a truth value, however. It can't be true. Hurry up and finish your tuna sandwich. Doesn't make sense to say that that's true or false. So this is not a statement. Pretty straightforward. But again, the key question for deciding whether something is or is not a statement, whether it has a truth value, whether it's true or false, even if you don't know whether the sentence is true or false. Moving on. So if you remember, an argument has two parts. An argument has premises and a conclusion. Premises are the reasons, a set of statements, one or more statements that are claimed to provide some reasons or evidence for the conclusion, which is another statement. Now, oftentimes in a logic class, we'll present statements as a series of statements, kind of number them, premise one, premise two, premise three, and a conclusion coming at the end. But in natural, ordinary language, that isn't always the case. Sometimes people state their conclusion up front and then give the reasons. Sometimes they'll give some reasons, draw a conclusion, then give you some additional reasons. So it's important to be able to identify which statement in a set of statements whether enumerated like you see here on the screen or in a natural ordinary language paragraph is the conclusion and which statements are being used as the reason for that conclusion. And so here we have some practice on that. We have several sets of sentences, some of which uh, contain a conclusion and some of which are premises. And we have to decide, you know, is this an argument? And if so, which, is the, uh, which statement is the conclusion? So let's look at, the, at this first um, set of sentences. How dare you forget my birthday? Question mark. Don't you remember the wonderful present I bought you last year? You'd better hope I don't tell my mother that you forgot my birthday. So I think this is pretty clearly not an argument. We don't even have statements here. The first two sentences are, are, sentence, are uh, questions, not statements. And the conclusion is something more like uh, an exclamation or a command or a warning. Um, so this is pretty clearly not an argument and no conclusion to identify there. In this next set, on the right side of the screen, a university education is not as necessary as it used to be. This is because more and more jobs require specific trade skills that cannot be learned at a traditional university. In addition, an increasing amount of work requiring higher education is now being outsourced to countries where labor is cheaper. So here we have, we have statements. It's true or false that a university education is not as necessary as it used to be. It's true or false that more and more jobs require specific trade skills that can't be learned at a traditional university. And it's true or false that an increasing amount of work requiring higher education is now being outsourced to countries where labor is cheaper. So all of these are, are statements. They're either true or false. And most importantly, though, two of these statements are being used as reasons for one of the other statements. And here, the conclusion is statement one, a university education is not as necessary as it used to be. And the other two statements are being used as evidence for that conclusion. So in this uh, set here, sentence one, uh, this, the whole set of sentences is an argument and sentence one is the conclusion. So again, Oftentimes in a logic class, we'll rearrange these so the conclusion comes at the end. So it feels more like a math problem, given all these reasons the conclusion has to follow. But oftentimes in ordinary language, the conclusion will come first or come in the middle or sometimes comes at the end. It's important to think about the inferential relationships between the statements, which statements are being used as evidence for which of the other statements. Let's do a couple more of these and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. How could you possibly have got x equals five as your answer? Didn't you see that y equals four? I have never seen such sloppy math in my entire life. 
This is pretty clearly not an argument. The first two sentences are not statements, they're questions, so they don't have a truth value. Sentence three, uh, it's, it, it certainly looks like a statement. I've never seen such sloppy math in my entire life. That's either true or false, but there's no inferential relationship here. Um, given that sentence one and sentence two aren't statements, they can't be used as evidence for that conclusion. So this is not an argument. And the last example here, Dr. Sullivan, how could you possibly suggest giving my husband a painful cancer treatment when he has only two weeks to live? What if the treatment isn't successful? Would you want your spouse to suffer even more during her final two weeks? Again, not an argument. The all statements here, all sentences here are not statements. They're, they're questions, not statements. So they don't have truth values. What's interesting about this last example is that it sounds argumentative. It sounds almost hostile. So again, I want you to keep in mind that an argument in logic does not mean an argument as we use it in common speech where two people are disagreeing with each other and sometimes that gets heated. An argument means an attempt to provide some reasons for a conclusion and that's not what's going on here. So this is not an argument. Okay, let's move on. I have to apologize a little bit for the transition between these, these screens. It takes a minute for each screen to load, so you'll have to bear with me. So here we've got some examples of different kinds of sentences, and we have to decide which of these sentences are statements. Let's run through these. Minnesota has a population of 5,167,101. Now, I don't know whether that's true or false, but that is either true or false. So that is a statement because it has a truth value, even if we don't know whether it's true or false. Quantum mechanics can be used to give an account of free will. In other words, quantum mechanics can be used to decide whether you know, we have free will, whether all our actions are determined. Now, again, even as a philosopher, I don't know whether that's true, but it is either true or false, that it works one way or the other. So that is a statement. Let's meet for coffee on Saturday. That's just a suggestion. That's not either true or false. So that is not a statement. Barack Obama was the 44th president of the United States. I think that's right. Was he the 44th or was he the 43rd? I think he was the 43rd, actually. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's either true or false that he was the 44th president of the United States. So that is a statement, even if it's a false statement. The Summer Olympics occur once every four years. That's either true or false. So that is a statement. Oddly enough, the Summer Olympics uh, this year are getting postponed next year. So I didn't know that when, uh, when I wrote these examples years and years ago. I suggest that you read great literature. I still suggest that. I still think that's a great idea. But it's not a statement because it doesn't have a truth value. It's neither true nor false. The next example, why must we always follow your suggestions? Not a statement. That's just a question. Doesn't have a truth value, so it's not a statement. Aspirin can help break a fever. That's either true or false. It happens to be true, so that is a statement. Let's not hold our breath. That is neither true nor false, it's just a suggestion. George Lucas directed Star Wars. That happens to be true, but most importantly, it has a truth value. It's either true or false, so it is a statement. Uranus has planetary rings. We didn't used to know that was true. Turns out that is true, but it has a truth value. It's either true or false, so that is a statement. I like this next one, duck. That is not a statement. More like a warning or a command, but it doesn't have a truth value, so it's not a statement. Voltage is electromotive force. If you know anything about electronics, you know that's true. But again, it's either true or false. It has a truth value, so it is a statement. Happy holidays, pretty clearly not a, not a statement. It doesn't have a truth value. Tag, you're it. That's not a, a statement. It doesn't have a truth value. And reptiles are cold-blooded. Um, happens to be true, but it has a truth value. It's either true or false, so it is a statement. So again, just to sum up, most importantly, if you're deciding whether a bit of language is a statement, you ask, is this either true or false? Even if you don't know whether it's true or false, if so, then it is a, uh, is a statement, has a truth value. Let's move on. So when you're reading arguments in natural language, there are words that can be used to indicate which statements in a, in a paragraph or in a passage is the conclusion and which statements are the premises. Uh, those words are called conclusion indicators and premise indicators, and your textbook lists a bunch of different types of these. So um, a common conclusion indicator, probably the most common conclusion indicator is 
therefore. But you also see things like consequently or it follows that. Little bits of language like that help us indicate which statement is the conclusion. And you should use them in your writing. When you're writing an argument, you should indicate which of your statements is the, the conclusion of your argument. It helps the reader understand the reasoning of, of your argument. So let's look at some examples here. Here's an argument. According to Thomas Aquinas, God is a necessarily existing being. Created beings, by contrast, are contingent rather than necessary. As a result, the concept of a natural right to life is incompatible with theism because human existence is radically contingent on the divine being's will. Don't worry too much about the language here, but I want you to pay attention to the structure. What about this um, passage, which bits of language in this passage tell you what the conclusion is? And I think here there's a pretty clear conclusion indicator. As a result, that tells you that what follows that little, little bit of language is the conclusion of this argument that's coming. So that's the conclusion indicator, as a result. Now, which statement best represents the conclusion of the argument? Well, it's the statement that follows that conclusion indicator. The concept of a natural right to life is incompatible with theism. And then what's interesting enough here, even though the sentence continues, you actually have two statements inside the same sentence. And that happens sometimes. You get a compound sentence where there's one grammatical sentence, but two individual statements inside that one sentence. So we have the conclusion, as a result, the concept of a natural right to life is incompatible with theism because, and then finally another reason is given. And so oddly enough here, we have a premise, we have a premise, then the conclusion, and the final premise of the argument. So this is a great example of a passage in which the conclusion does not come at the end of the passage. So be on the lookout for that when you're doing your homework examples. Let's look at a couple more examples of this. A motorcycle is an extremely dangerous vehicle. Common motorcycle injuries include head trauma and skin lacerations. But you can prevent many motorcycle related injuries by wearing protective gear, such as a helmet and proper attire when riding. Hence, you should always wear protective gear when riding a motorcycle. Happily, the conclusion comes at the end of this passage, unlike the example above, but there's one phrase here that tells you what the conclusion is, and it's the word hence. Hence, then the conclusion follows. So the conclusion indicator here is hence. And which statement best represents the conclusion of the argument? It's the statement that follows that conclusion indicator. You should always wear protective gear when riding a motorcycle, right there. And one more example before we move on. Science fiction encourages a healthy imagination. This imagination can help you envision different ways the world could be. Moreover, science fiction often presents an optimistic vision of the future. It follows that science fiction is healthy for the development of your worldview. So here, the conclusion indicator, I think it's pretty clear is that it follows that. Oops, I made a typo there, here we go. It follows that is the conclusion indicator. And then the statement that follows, the bit of language that's either true or false, follows the conclusion indicator. Science fiction is healthy for the development of your worldview, right there. So again, conclusion indicators can be a helpful way of identifying what the conclusions are. They're not present in every argument. Sometimes you'll have to use the inferential relationships that the author has written to identify the conclusion directly. But if a good writer will often signpost what the conclusion is using one of these conclusion indicators. Therefore, consequently, hence, it follows that little bits of language like that. Let's move on. So just as there are conclusion indicators, there are also premise indicators that indicate the premise of an argument. And there are lots of these, things like since and because. You can see a couple examples here in the introductory uh, text of this page. So let's read a couple of uh, example arguments and see if we can find the premise indicators. Euthanasia should be considered only in extreme cases. We can conclude this for the reason that some people in even the deepest coma states occasionally regain consciousness. This conclusion must also be true since widespread euthanasia would create a model of murder for convenience. And finally, the conclusion follows, inasmuch as the costs of keeping a person alive in a vegetative state for 10 or 20 years would unnecessarily burden those responsible for their care. So there should be three premise indicators in this argument. Notice there's no conclusion indicator. The conclusion here is the first sentence. Euthanasia should be considered only in extreme cases. Every, everything else in this, uh, in this passage, all the other statements are reasons for thinking that that conclusion is true. 
So let's see what we can find. We can conclude this for the reason that, so the phrase for the reason that, oops, hello, would be a, a premise indicator for the, in this argument. The thing that follows, some people even in the, in the deepest coma states occasionally regain conscious. That's the first premise or the first reason that's given. Let's find the next one. This conclusion must also be true since, notice we have another premise indicator here, since. That tells us that what follows the word since is another reason that's coming. Since. And the reason that follows is widespread euthanasia would create a model of murder for convenience. You can think what you want about whether those reasons are actually true or false and whether they support the, the conclusion, but definitely the word sense indicates that the author of this passage is using the statement that follows as a reason for the conclusion. And let's see the next one here. And finally, the conclusion follows in as much as, and this is kind of a weird phrase, we don't use this in natural speech very much, used in more formal writing, in as much as the cost of keeping a person alive, and this is a very long premise here, the cost of keeping a person alive in a vegetative state for 10 or 20 years would unnecessarily burden those responsible for their care. Again, that might be true or false, but it's definitely being used as a reason for the conclusion as indicated by this premise indicator in as much as. So those are the three premise indicators used in, in this argument. Now, for time's sake, I'm going to move on. We can, you can see similar examples of this inside your textbook, and you're going to find, see examples of this in the homework exercises you have to do. But one of the clearest indicators of, of the structure of an argument are the premise indicators or the conclusion indicators. Oftentimes, they'll be present. Sometimes they won't, and sometimes you'll have to just rely on, the, on your interpretation of the inferential relationships of, between the statements in, in an argument to decide what are the reasons and what's the conclusion that's being drawn for the reasons. I think a good clear writer will use these, these premise and conclusion indicators to help indicate the structure of the argument that they're creating. So let's move on. Again, minor apologies for the uh, load time of these pages. So earlier in the video, we talked about good arguments versus bad, bad arguments. Now, we've already made some distinctions between different types of good arguments, different kinds of bad arguments. Remember, there are deductive arguments and inductive arguments. For deductive arguments, those arguments are either valid or invalid and sound or unsound. For inductive arguments, those arguments are either strong or weak and cogent or uncogent. But more generally than that, I want you to pay attention to what what the textbook kind of very vaguely in the, in the first section of the book calls good arguments or bad arguments. And I think this is a really intuitive notion. In a good argument, the premises really do provide evidence for the conclusion. And in a bad argument, the premises really don't provide good reason for the conclusion. Now, all the terms that I introduced, validity and, and soundness, strength and cogency, disambiguate that a little bit and give you uh, a more structured way of thinking about what makes a good argument, what makes a bad argument. But I want you to get uh, get familiar with the notion of a good argument versus a bad argument, even before you master that, those terms. So let's look at some examples. These are all arguments. They're either good arguments or bad arguments. The premises either support the conclusion or they don't. And we'll talk about that in more technical detail a little later in the, in, in the second part of the video. So the first argument, all beetles are insects, all butterflies are insects, therefore all butterflies are beetles. So the first two premises are true. All beetles are insects, all butterflies are insects, but it doesn't follow from that that all butterflies are beetles. So this is not a good argument. It's a bad argument. The, the conclusion does not follow from those reasons. Again, don't worry too much about the terminology yet. I do want you to master the terminology, but even more important than that, I want you to kind of internalize this notion that a conclusion has to follow logically from a set of reasons. Argument B, if it's raining, then the ground is wet. That's premise one. Premise two, if the sprinklers are on, then the ground is wet. The conclusion, if it's raining, then the sprinklers are on. So the first two premises are true. If it's raining, then the ground is wet. Premise two, if the sprinklers are on, then the ground is wet. But it doesn't follow from that, that if it's raining, then the sprinklers are on. So this is also a bad argument because that conclusion does not logically follow from those premises. And again, we'll talk more about the technical definition of a good argument and a bad argument with further examples a little later in the video. For anyone who's watching this saying, ha ha, you didn't use the right terms. Hold on, we're gonna get there. Argument C, no Democrat is a Republican. Jill is a Democrat, therefore Jill is not a Republican. So what do you think about this one? No Democrat is a Republican. That seems right, you're either one or the other. Jill is a Democrat. If those are both true, then it follows that Jill is not a Republican. So this is a good argument. Those premises give you reason for thinking that the conclusion would have to be true. 
And argument D, either a trout is a mammal or a whale is a mammal, but we know that a trout is not a mammal, therefore it is certain that a whale is a mammal. Well, this would be a good argument if both premises are true. And so premise one is an either or statement. One of two things has to be the case. And premise two, that tells you one of the, one of the two things is false. That means the other one would have to be true. And that's what we see here. This is a good argument. Again, don't worry about the technical terms here. We'll uh, look at the, the, the technical terms a little later in the video. One thing you'll commonly see me do, uh, in fact, almost entirely through the rest of the course, is present arguments in what, what's called standard form. In standard form, you take all of the premises and enumerate them. Premise one, premise two, premise three, premise four, however many there are. Could be only one, there could be 10, there could be 100. And then one conclusion. Uh, so here we have an argument in natural language. Ticks are pesky, dangerous, and ubiquitous. Therefore, they should be exterminated, seeing as how they carry Lyme disease. So this is a pretty short passage, but actually there are several reasons, several premises packed into this short little argument. The first is that ticks are pesky. The next is that ticks are dangerous. So you can see what I've done here is I've actually rewritten these uh, these compound statements and broken them apart. So each single statement is, is enumerated as, as, as a complete statement, complete with a subject and a, and a predicate. So ticks are dangerous, ticks are ubiquitous. All of that is captured by this ordinary language phrase, ticks are pesky, dangerous, and ubiquitous. Those are really three different statements packed into the same English, grammatical English sentence. Therefore, they should be exterminated. That therefore is a conclusion indicator. So we know that's the conclusion and you can see that here on the, on the right. The conclusion ticks should be exterminated are, is, uh, is, is at the very bottom of the list indicated as a conclusion. And the, in the natural language statement, interestingly enough, another reason is given. Seeing is how, that's a premise indicator, they carry Lyme disease. So we have four premises here. Ticks are pesky, ticks are dangerous, ticks are ubiquitous, means they're everywhere. Ticks carry Lyme disease, Therefore, the conclusion, ticks should be in, exterminated. So this is called standard form, enumerating all of the, the simple atomic statements that make up a, an argument and uh, the conclusion presented at the end. Sometimes it's drawn with a line to separate the premises from a conclusion. Here, it's just premise one, premise two, premise three, premise four, and the letter C for, for the, the conclusion. But this is standard form, premise, 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 some way of indicating the conclusion separated from the premises. So let's do an example of this. Here we have a natural language statement that we're gonna rewrite in standard form. QWERTY keyboards are difficult to master and they're they counterintuitive. Other keyboard configurations are more efficient. So QWERTY keyboards should be abandoned because they can easily be replaced with other keyboard configurations. So let's first of all, see if we can identify the conclusion. I think that's, when I'm trying to evaluate the structure of an argument, I find it easier to, to identify the conclusion first and then start thinking about what reasons are given for the, for the conclusion. So here we have um, a, pretty, a pretty clear conclusion indicator. So it's a short conclusion indicator, but it indicates the conclusion. So QWERTY keyboard should be abandoned. And even though the sentence goes on, what follows in the rest of the sentence is another reason, which you can see here because of the word, because a premise indicator. So let's write the conclusion. QWERTY keyboards are not R, should be abandoned. That's the conclusion. Your space in there, there we go. There we go. And now what we wanna do is start enumerating the, the simple statements that make up the reasons for this conclusion. Let's dive in. <clears throat> In the first sentence, QWERTY keyboards are difficult to master and they are counterintuitive. Notice here, you actually have two statements in one. QWERTY keyboards are difficult to master, that's either true or false, and they, meaning QWERTY keyboards, are counterintuitive. So you actually have two statements inside the same sentence. So let's write these out. QWERTY keyboards are difficult to master. There we go. And QWERTY keyboards 
are counterintuitive. And when you're putting arguments in standard form like this, you might have to supply the missing noun phrases. Notice here that the English language sentence uh, argument up here just says they are counterintuitive, but they means QWERTY keyboards again. So when you're writing these sentences out, you want to supply the actual noun phrases, replacing the pronouns with actual noun phrases. Okay, what's the third premise here? Other keyboard configurations are more efficient. Okay. And finally, and even though the conclusion comes in the middle of the passage, we have another reason given here because they can easily be replaced with other keyboard configurations. Now, again, we want to replace the pronouns. We have the word they, but they refers to what? QWERTY keyboards. QWERTY keyboards can easily be replaced, replaced with other keyboard configurations. And now we've got a restructured argument. QWERTY keyboards are difficult to master. QWERTY keyboards are counterintuitive. Other keyboard configurations are more efficient. QWERTY keyboards can easily be replaced with other keyboard configurations. Therefore, QWERTY keyboards should be abandoned. Let's do one more example to drive, drive the proverbial point home. Cellular phones should be banned at our next meeting. Cellular phone users are rude and unprincipled. And in addition, guest speakers are easily distracted by cellular phones. Moreover, cellular phones are spreading like a plague. Okay, so what's the conclusion here? I think it's pretty clear that the conclusion comes first. Cellular phones should be banned at our next meeting. Everything else here is in service of uh, of demonstrating why that conclusion is, uh, should be accepted. So cellular phones, interestingly enough, when, uh, when I wrote this quite a few years ago, no one called them cell phones, they were cellular phones. So this is a little out of date. Cellular phones should be banned at our next meeting. Now let's identify the conclusion. Cellular phone users are rude and unprincipled. Notice there are two premises in one here. Cellular, cellular phone users are rude and cellular phone users are unprincipled. So again, if you have a compound statement like that, you wanna break them apart into atomic statements. Cellular, cellular phone users are rude and cellular phone users are unprincipled. In addition, so here comes more reasons. <clears throat> Guest speakers are easily distracted by cellular phones. So, okay, guest speakers are easily distracted by cellular phones. True as anything I've ever heard that's true. Moreover, you have more reasons being given here. Moreover, cellular phones are spreading like a plague. freaking spreading like and finally now we have our restructured argument four reasons and one conclusion that's claimed to follow from those reasons cellular phone users are rude cellular phone users are unprincipled guest speakers are easily distracted by cellular phones cellular phones are spreading like a plague Therefore, the conclusion, cellular phone should be banned at our next meeting. So again, this is called standard form, rewriting the passage to make complete grammatical sentences of every premise enumerated in order with a conclusion coming at the end, often indicated either by a, a label here like you see, see here for conclusion, or you could just draw a line to separate the premises from the conclusion. Okay, let's move on. Give me just a moment to pull up the next uh, set of examples. <clears throat> so if you remember, we made some distinctions between things that count as arguments and things that don't count as arguments. And the important thing about an argument is that an argument is made up of a bunch of statements as we just saw, some of which the reasons or the premises are being used as support for the conclusion, which is another statement that's claimed to follow from those reasons. And there's lots of other types of passages, causal inferences and uh, explanations. We, we looked at a, a bunch of these types of, uh, of uh, passages that are, aren't arguments for uh, earlier in the video. And now we're going to look at a bunch, a bunch of examples and just uh, kind of drive this point home and hopefully we can get the intuitive sense of what counts as an argument versus what doesn't count as an argument. <clears throat> okay. So again, as a reminder, 
Arguments are made up of premises and a conclusion. The premises provide reasons or evidence for the conclusion, and the conclusion is claimed to follow from those reasons. One way to put this is that an argument has two parts to it. It makes what's known as an inferential claim and a factual claim. An inferential claim is the relationship between the premises and a conclusion. It says that you can infer the conclusion from the reasons that are given or from the premises that are given. But an argument also claims that the premises are true. It says, given these things that are true, something has to follow from them. And those are called an inferential claim and a factual claim here. In fact, we can uh, kind of fill in this fill in the blank paragraph with, the, with these two terms. Since an argument requires premises, an argument must claim that at least one statement presents true reasons or evidence. This property of an argument is known as the argument's factual claim. It says that those reasons are actually true. They might actually be false, but the author of the argument, the person giving the argument, is claiming that those premises are true. And, continuing the paragraph here, since an argument also requires a conclusion, an argument must claim that some statement follows from the true reasons or evidence presented in the premises. This property of an argument, in other words, the fact that the conclusion is claimed to follow from the premises is known as the argument's inferential claim. In other words, there's an inference between the premises and the conclusion. You can infer the conclusion from the premises. So on this page, we've got some examples of passages that are not arguments, and we have to decide, is it not an argument because there's no inference? In other words, there's no premises and conclusions, or is there no factual claim? Is it not claiming that anything is true, that there's no, there are no true premises from which to draw a conclusion? So let's see what we have. To, to ensure your safety, you should go through the following steps when answering the door. First, ask who it is. Next, look through the peephole. Finally, open the door slowly and cautiously. Now, interestingly enough, this passage has a bunch of things that are true. Do this, do that, first do this, then do that. But there's no inferential claim. There's no conclusion being drawn from anything that's given here. So this passage lacks an inferential claim. There's no conclusion being drawn from a set of reasons. If any student is caught cheating on the exam, then the entire class will be penalized. Interestingly enough, this seems to lack both a factual claim and an inferential claim. This is just a single if-then statement. Um, and if you have a single if-then statement, there is an inference. You know, you, you kind of conclu conclude the, the consequent from the antecedent. So I would say this lacks more of a factual claim. It says if something is the case, something follows from that, but it's not saying anything is actually true in this, in this example. So it lacks a factual claim. The sun sets earlier in the winter than in the summer because Earth's axis is tilted at an angle to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now, this is a, a true statement. It's a fairly lengthy true statement. So it does make a factual claim, but there's no conclusion being drawn from this fact. So there's no inferential claim. Therefore, it's not an argument. So again, argument has to have two parts, a set of reasons or premises, the author claims that those are true, and some conclusion that the author either explicitly or implicitly, implicitly claims follows from, the, um, from, from those reasons. Okay, let's move on. Pretty simple examples. Okay. So when an author makes an inferential claim, in other words, when the author of a passage says, gives you an argument, it says, here's some reasons and a conclusion follows. An author can do that explicitly with conclusion indicators saying, therefore, or consequently, or it follows that some conclusion follows. That's called an explicit inferential claim. The author has made explicit that there's a conclusion being drawn. But you can also have what's known as an implicit inferential claim where there's no conclusion indicator and you have to infer what the conclusion is based based on the context of the passage. So we've got a few arguments here, and uh, they either use an explicit inferential claim or an implicit inferential claim. Let's see what we have. It can only be concluded that a paperless society will never come to pass. Although people used to think that electronic media and electronic communication would replace paper communication entirely, paper communication is as prevalent as it used to be despite the omnipresence of electronic substitutes. This conclusion is also evidenced by the failure of electronic books to replace traditional paper books as the primary mode by which people read longer literary works. So this is pretty clearly, this argument, it's an argument. It contains an explicit in inferential claim. At least a couple of instances here, the argument says explicitly, it can be concluded that. 
he tells you there's a conclusion coming. And the fact that there's a conclusion is also referenced later in the passage. So this argument makes an explicit inferential claim. It says, here's a conclusion because of all these reasons. That's explicitly saying there's an argument. Every hardship is endurable. This can be seen from the following considerations. Regardless of your situation, there are either actions you can take to improve it, or there are ways of better handling the situation psychologically. Some situations may demand radical action, and some situations may demand radical psychological detachment. But even the worst situations are endurable with the right action and the right mindset. So again, we have something here in the passage that indicates that there's an argument. This can be seen, namely this previous statement, every hardship is endurable, that can be seen from the following considerations. And this entire um, statement here, this can be seen from the following consider considerations, all of that is an indicator that everything else that comes in the passage are reasons for that conclusion. So this argument also makes an explicit inferential claim. It says, I'm giving you some reasons for a conclusion. Our computer network has been compromised. Spurious network access requests have been detected and similar access requests have been shown to be signs of malicious software having infiltrated a computer network. Network performance has also decreased by 20% over the past five days and this type of performance decrease is highly unusual. So there is an argument here. The first statement, our computer network has been compromised, is the conclusion and everything else in the passage are reasons for concluding that the computer network has been com compromised. But notice here that there are no premise or conclusion indicators. There's nothing here before the conclusion saying therefore or consequently, and there's nothing in the passage that indicates that there are reasons being given. Something like sense or for the reason that you have to rely on the fact that you have to notice, in other words, that this first statement is being is being as a conclusion that's being drawn from everything else that's given in this passage, even though the conclusion comes first. So this argument makes an implicit inferential claim. There is an argument here. Some of the statements are providing evidence for one of the other statements, but none of that is being signposted with conclusion or premise indicators inside the argument. Moving on. So if you remember, in the first part of the video, we talked about several kinds of simple non-inferential passages. Short passages where there's no inference. In other words, where there aren't premises in a conclusion, where no reasons are being provided for a conclusion. And there are several kinds of those that the textbook gives. A warning, a statement of belief or opinion, a report, a piece of advice, or this kind of willy-nilly term, a set of loosely associated statements where there's no real connection between the statements. So let's look at some examples. All of these are non-arguments. No, there are no premises in a conclusion. The question is, what are they then? The cafeteria serves wonderful coffee, the recreation center offers free massages, and the buses always seem to be on time. To me, that looks like a set of loosely associated statements. There are three things that are true, maybe, but there's no connection between them around three kind of random topics. So not an argument, just statements that are not connected to each other in any logical way. Being poor is no excuse for sloth. Being rich is no excuse for corruption. Being virtuous is no excuse for self-importance. I think we have the same thing going on here. We have a set of loosely associated statements, three things that may or may not be true, but there's no logical connection between them, three almost completely different topics. In fact, these are randomized. All of these might be examples of a set of loosely associated statements. I was trying to see if there's an example of a different, different kind here, but no such luck. Like for example, in passage D, Moby Dick is about the inherent dangers of seeking revenge. Romeo and Juliet is a sub sublimely tragic romance and 1984 is an anti-utopian critique of modernity. These are just three random statements, not three deeply connected statements. I'm trying to see if I can pull up a, a different randomization version of this. Don't think so. That's okay, we'll move on. I think you get the idea. Okay. 
So let's look at an example. Um, if you remember in the textbook and earlier in the video, we talked about other kinds of non-arguments, types of passages that are, that are not arguments. We have expository passages. In other words, passages that merely expand on some idea. Illustrations where specific examples are being given of some general principle and explanations, explaining why something is the case or how something got to be the case without attempting to provide reasons or, or, uh, or evidence for some conclusion that's being drawn. So let's look at a couple of examples here. Passage A, polar bears are being threatened with extinction because global warming is melting the polar ice caps that make up the species natural habitat. So this passage is not trying to prove to you that polar, polar bears are being threatened with extinction. It's explaining why they're being threatened with extinction. So there's no argument here. There's no attempt to provide evidence for a conclusion. It's merely an explanation. And let's look at passage B. Marriage is an extremely deep commitment. In addition to being committed to the same partner for life, participants in a marriage carry each other's legal and financial burdens. Marriage partners in a healthy marriage also help each other with whatever emotional issues they face. So let's see here, marriage is an extremely deep commitment. The rest of the passage does not try to prove that that's the case. It's explaining why it's the case. But not in the next one, it's not explaining like why something is the fact, like polar, like the case of the polar bears example. This is more like an expository passage. There's a main idea here. Marriage is an extremely deep commitment. And the rest of the passage expands on that idea, but doesn't try to prove that marriage is an extremely deep commitment. So this is merely an expository passage. What's interesting here in all of these examples is structurally they look very similar to arguments. You might mistake this first part of passage A, polar bears are being threatened with extinction as a conclusion, when really there's no argument going on here because there's no attempt to provide evidence for that. Likewise in passage B, you might mistake that first sentence as a conclusion, marriage is an extremely deep commitment, but really there's no argument here because the rest of the passage isn't trying to prove that or isn't trying to provide reasons for that. It's merely expanding on the idea. So no argument here. In an argument, there has to be either an explicit or an implicit claim that some of the statements are being used as evidence or as reason to conclude the, uh, the conclusion. But you can see it's a little hard to tell. In some cases, it's hard to tell whether you have an argument or where you have something that's, that's kind of masquerading as an argument. Let's move on. So in this page, we have a contrast between arguments and explanations. Don't worry too much about this. I'm not, this isn't really related directly to anything we're gonna talk about later in the class, but it's interesting though, just as an argument has two parts, it ha you have a, a, yeah, a set of premises and a conclusion that follows. If you have an explanation, which is not an argument, an explanation also has two parts, the thing that's being explained and the thing that's doing the explaining. And there are two Latin terms here that go along with these two parts, the explanans and the explanandum. Most of you probably don't know Latin. I happen to know Latin, but explanans is the thing doing the explaining and an explanandum means the thing to be explained. <clears throat> and so an explanation has these two parts. And again, what's hard here is that it's very easy to confuse arguments and explanations. In an argument, reasons are being given for a conclusion that's supposed to follow from those, those, those reasons. But in an explanation, the, the thing to be explained is given as true, and then the rest of the passage uh, merely explains why that's the case, doesn't try to prove that it's the case. But it can be a little bit of a fuzzy gray area between what counts as an argument and what counts as an explanation. So let's see what we have here. Uh, in each of these passages, we have to determine whether the passage is an argument or an explanation, and then we have to answer a couple of questions. So passage A. Jessica fell in love with Mark because Mark is both intelligent and caring. So this passage is not trying to prove to you that Jessica fell in love with Mark. It's explaining why she did. So this is pretty clearly an explanation. In passage B, gold is a heavier element than helium because there are more subatomic particles in an atom of gold than in an atom of helium. I think we also have a, an explanation here. This author is not trying to prove to you that gold is a heavier element than helium, but merely explaining why that's the case. Now let's answer these questions about these passages. The claim that Jessica fell in love with Mark serves as the, well, let's see, if it's not an argument, it can't have premises and conclusions, it has an explanons or an explanandum, something doing the explaining or something to be explained. 
Jessica fell in love with Mark is the explanandum, the thing to be explained. And why did she fall in love with Mark? In other words, what's the thing doing the explaining, the explanons? That's because Mark is both intelligent and caring. So that is the explanons, the part that explains the explanandum. Same thing in passage B. We don't have an argument, so we don't have premises and conclusions, but the claim that there are more subatomic particles in an atom of gold than in an atom of helium, that's the thing doing the explaining. So this is the explanons in that case, and the claim that gold is heavier element than helium is the thing to be explained, the explanandum. Okay. You'll see lots of examples like this in your homework. But again, I think there's a, there's a danger in a class like this where you can get really bogged down by the terminology. And the terminology is important because it provides some, you know, some, some technical structure to these, uh, to these activities and these intuitions about what counts as, as good logical reasoning. And they're important that we're going to spend a lot of time on them. But I want you to develop an intuitive sense of what an argument is and attempt to provide reasons for something. And then you can talk about how well the argument actually does that versus these other kinds of writing and other kinds of passages that can look like arguments structurally, but really have some other purpose or some other intention to them. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about conditional statements. I'm doing this mainly for completion's sake right now. We're going to talk about conditional statements a, a little later in the course, in a couple of weeks. Um, but it's worth, uh, if only for completion's sake, talking about, about the parts of a conditional statement, if only because they can look like an argument. An if-then statement, if A, then B, can look a little bit like an argument, because an argument has two parts as well, premises and a conclusion. But as we, we talked about earlier in the video, a conditional statement is just a single statement with two parts, not two, um, two um, uh, statements with an inferential relationship between them. So the two parts of a conditional statement are the antecedent and the consequent. Ant, ante is the Latin word for before. So antecedent is the if part, the hypothetical part of an if-then statement. And the consequent is the second part or the latter part of, the, uh, of an if-then statement. So let's answer the question here. Uh, the two parts of a conditional statement are the antecedent and the consequent. In an if-then statement, the consequent follows the word then. The antecedent follows the word if. <clears throat> Let's look at some examples. Consider the conditional statement in the following box, then complete the following questions by typing the appropriate sta statements in the spaces provided. Here's another Star Trek example. I, interestingly enough, I wrote this years and years ago. I probably wrote this 12 years ago. If Captain Kirk is captain of the Enterprise, then Captain Kirk will boldly go where no man has gone before. In this conditional sentence, which statement is the consequent? So we have one sentence here, it's a conditional sentence, but there are two components to it. The antecedent, the part that follows if, and the consequent, the part that follows then. And here we have a statement that follows the word then, the consequent. Captain Kirk will boldly go where no man has gone before. So the next thing that I wanna talk about really briefly are these two terms, necessary condition and sufficient condition. The two parts of a conditional can also be described in terms of necessary conditions or sufficient conditions. And let's look at, at this example. If Captain Kirk is captain of the Enterprise, then Captain Kirk will boldly go where no man has gone before. If that's a true if-then statement, then the consequent necessarily follows from, from the antecedent. In other words, if Captain Kirk really is the captain of the Enterprise, it's necessary then that Captain Kirk will boldly go where no man has gone before. So the necessary condition is the consequent of a conditional. The antecedent, the hypothetical part, is called a sufficient condition because if this is a true if-then statement, I want you to kind of think through this language. If this if-then statement is true, Captain Kirk being captain of the Enterprise is sufficient to bring about the fact that Captain Kirk will boldly go where no man has gone before. So that's called the sufficient condition, the antecedent of a conditional. Captain Kirk is captain of the enterprise. That would be the sufficient condition. Don't worry about those terms too much yet, but that's another way of describing the two parts of an if-then statement, the two parts of a conditional statement. And we'll spend more time on that later in the class. I don't want you to sweat about that right now. Okay, moving on. Well, while we're at it, let's spend a little time on necessary and sufficient conditions. We have a few examples. We might as well look at a couple. Passing a college course, is that sufficient or necessary for getting an A in the class? 
It's not necessary. There are lots of ways to pass a course like this. You can get a B or a C and still pass the course, but it is sufficient. If you get an A in the class, you are guaranteed to pass the class. So getting an A in the class is sufficient for passing a college course. And we can rewrite this as an if then statement. If you get an A in the college course, then you are passing a college course. So again, the sufficient condition is the antecedent of the conditional and the necessary condition are, is the, the consequent of the conditional. And I think you can describe this another way. You can say that if you get an A in the class, you'll pass the college course. Passing the college course is necessary if you get an A in the class. Drinking a soft drink is, is that necessary or sufficient for drinking a Coca-Cola? What's necessary? It's not sufficient. There are lots of ways to drink, uh, to drink a soft drink. Um, but drinking a soft drink is a necessary condition for drinking a Coca-Cola, right? If you're drinking a Coca-Cola, you're necessarily drinking a soft drink by definition. So if you're drinking a Coca-Cola, then you're drinking a soft drink. Drinking a soft drink is the necessary condition and drinking a Coca-Cola would be the sufficient condition or the antecedent of the, of the conditional. Being made of metal, is that necessary or sufficient for being made of copper? What's well, necessary, right? If something is made of copper, necessarily means that it's made of metal as well. And we could rewrite this as a conditional. If there is copper, then there is metal, not vice versa. Something's metal doesn't necessarily mean it's made of copper, so it doesn't go the other way around. And notice that conditionals are like that. You can't flip them around. If you have if A, then B, that doesn't mean the same thing as if B, then A. Conditionals are not reversible in that way. Riding on two wheels, is that sufficient or necessary for riding a bicycle? Well, it's necessary. It's not sufficient because there are lots of other ways to, uh, to ride on two wheels. So if you are riding a bicycle, then you're riding on two wheels. So again, this is just a little bit of a detour, but while it was here in front of me, I thought we'd spend a little time on it. And we'll spend more time on conditionals later in the class. Moving on. So now we've got to decide, put it all together. We've got a bunch of different passages here and we need to decide, are these arguments or are they non-arguments, something other than an argument? Let's figure it out. A space elevator is a practical alter alternative to traditional rocketry for getting goods and supplies into orbit. This conclusion follows from the fact that traditional rocketry is largely inefficient use of energy because most of the energy in rocket fuel is dissipated as heat in the atmosphere. Moreover, advances in our ability to station a satellite in geosynchronous orbit, orbit, along with advances in construction materials, eliminate previous difficulties in rendering a space elevator practical. Here, this is pretty clearly an argument. We have a conclusion indicator here. This conclusion follows from the fact that, and then everything else that follows are reasons for that conclusion. So this is pretty clearly an argument. Many modern cellular phones are more than just mobile phones. For example, the iPhone lets you surf the internet. Does anyone say surfing the internet anymore? Is that a little 12 year old phrase now? The LG chocolate phone, which isn't the thing anymore either, doubles as an MP3 player and the Voyager has a full QWERTY keypad for text messaging. So this is merely giving examples. It's an illustration. We have a general claim up here. Many modern cellular phones are more than just mobile phones. And then we have three examples that follow from that. So this is not an attempt to prove that, that, that it's not an attempt to prove that modern cell phones are more than just mobile phones. These are just giving examples of that idea, merely an illustration. Every single atom in a grain of sand has mass, and there are multiple atoms in a grain of sand. So, since, a mass is, since mass is an additive property, it must be the case that a grain of sand has mass. This is pretty clearly an argument. We have a conclusion indicator here. So, since this mass is an additive property, actually, it's, this is an interesting structure. We actually have a conclusion indicator followed immediately by a premise indicator. So, because of this premise, it must be the case that a conclusion, a grain of sand has mass. This is an argument. Very short argument, but an argument nonetheless. Being a mammal is a necessary condition for being a whale. So since an insect is not a mammal, we know that an insect cannot be a whale. This is also an argument. As indicated by the phrase, we know that, and then everything else is a, is a reason. We also have the, a, a premise indicator here, since. That's an argument. 
So it can be really tricky to distinguish what's an argument from what's not an argument, especially given all these different kinds of passages that are not an argument, and given that some of them look very structurally and grammatically similar to arguments. So you're going to get some practice on this in your homework exercises over this week, the exercises that are due on Sunday. Okay, we've got a bit more to cover, so let's dive in. Let me go back to the uh, outline here. Let's talk about deduction and induction now. So if you remember from the first part of the video, there are two kinds of arguments, two very broad categories of arguments, deductive arguments and inductive arguments. In a deductive argument, the conclusion is supposed to follow from the premises by necessity. If the premises are true, the conclusion is supposed to follow with absolute certainty. And an inductive argument in which the conclusion is supposed to follow from the premises merely by probability or by likelihood, not by necessity. So let's see what we have here. We've got some specific examples. This morning, I discovered a ring-shaped coffee stain on my desk. Therefore, it can be concluded that someone left a cup of coffee on my desk overnight. So here we have um, an example of causal reasoning. We've got an effect. We see the ring on the desk, and we're trying to reason backward to the cause of that. And all causal inferences are inductive arguments. That conclusion follows by probability. You can always think of another explanation for how that ring got there. It doesn't follow by necessity, so this is an inductive argument. Next example, a certain rectangular shaped building has a footprint of 30 feet by 20 feet and a height of 10 feet. So it follows from these dimensions that the building has a volume of 6,000 cubic feet. So this is mathematical reasoning. If those numbers work out, that conclusion has to be true. So this reasoning is a reasoning by necessity. So the argument is deductive and most arguments from mathematics are deductive in nature. Okay, next example. A random survey of 5,000 residents of a certain town indicates that 75% of the 5,000 were graduates of the local university. Based upon this survey, it follows that most of the town's residents are graduates of the local university. So here we have a general generalization. We have a small sample size, 5,000 res residents who have taken a survey and we're drawing some conclusion about the overall population. So all generalizations of that form, arguing from some small number of examples to some more general or broader claim of a larger number of examples, that, um, all of that is inductive reasoning. And I think you can see why, uh, you know, from the fact that you pulled 5,000 residents doesn't tell you all that much about, about the, you know, what's true about all residents in general, although there's a whole science and mathematics to polling as well. So this argument is inductive, it gives you some reason for thinking that the conclusion is true, but it doesn't follow by necessity that that conclusion has to be true. Boy, this one's out of date because the Raiders just moved to uh, Las Vegas. Neither the San Francisco 49ers nor the Oakland Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders, won the Super Bowl. From this, it follows that the 49ers did not win the Super Bowl and that the Raiders did not win the Super Bowl. This is an interesting example. Um, kind of follows by definition, right? If neither one won the Super Bowl, then it means the 49ers didn't win the Super Bowl and the Raiders didn't win the Super Bowl. So that conclusion follows by necessity for sure. And this argument is deductive as a result. Okay, I think you can see the important question to ask here. If you're trying to decide whether, the, whether an argument is deductive or inductive, you can do it in one of two ways. You can try to classify the argument as one of the, the, the typical examples of deductive and inductive arguments that the tech, textbook lists. But you can also ask this very general question. Is this conclusion supposed to follow by probability or is that conclusion followed by necessity, absolute illogical necessity? If so, that's the difference between an inductive and a, and a deductive argument. Let's move on. So just as there are indicators for premises and conclusions, there are also indicator words and phrases that can kind of uh, signpost whether an argument is deductive or inductive. Um, yeah, I think you can imagine what these are, right? If it's a deductive argument, you might see a phrase like, it necessarily follows that, or it must be the case that. If it's an inductive argument, you might have something like, 
it's likely that, or it's probably that, or we have some good reason for thinking that, something a little less strong. The danger is that sometimes you get an inductive argument like a weather report or a prediction about the future or some causal inference where the author of the argument has tried to buff up the strength of their argument by saying, therefore, it necessarily follows that. But really, you still have an inductive argument going on where because of the type of reasoning going on inside the argument. Um, that issue aside, let's dive in and look at some of these examples. Um, argument A, Anne is a trial witness for a criminal case in which Mr. Eddy has been charged with misdemeanor reckless driving. Anne has testified that the defendant, Mr. Eddy, swerved across two lanes of traffic. It is reasonable to conclude that Mr. Eddy swerved across two lanes of traffic. Let's see, does argument A use an indicator phrase? Yes, it does. It says it's reasonable to conclude. Notice that's a little weaker than saying it necessarily follows that or it must be the case that. It just says it's reasonable to conclude. It's kind of a, a, a lower claim. Uh, argument B, a homeowner has a severe fight with a neighbor. Premise two, the next day the homeowner discovers that the tires on his automobile are all flat. Conclusion, the neighbor has deflated the homeowner's tires. Now, this is a causal inference. There's a cause and effect relationship being, being uh, given here. Uh, still an inductive argument, but there's no indicator phrase. Argument A is inductive and argument B is also inductive. And I think you can see from this that the indicator doesn't, in, doesn't tell you for sure whether the argument is deductive or indu in, inductive. The, an indicator can be helpful, but sometimes they're not present. And sometimes they can be even a little misleading because someone might say their conclusion necessarily follows, but really they're still getting a kind of inductive argument. So those can be helpful, but a little misleading sometimes. <clears throat> I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. We already talked about this. Okay, so we talked about several kinds of deductive argument forms earlier in the video. We talked about arguments based on mathematics. I think it's pretty clear why those are deductive. Mathematical reasoning always involves necessary reasoning. Arguments from definition, if your argument relies on merely on the definitions of the words involved, then the argument's gonna be deductive. And various types of syllogism, little two premise arguments with a conclusion, categorical syllogism dealing with categorical relationships, a hypothetical syllogism with an if then statement in the premises, or a disjunctive syllogism with an either or statement in the premises. So here we've got some deductive arguments and we need to decide which kind of deductive argument we've got. Argument A, some personal problems are objects of worry. All objects of worry cause great distress. Therefore, some personal problems cause great distress. Notice here that there are two premises and a conclusion. We've got categorical statements, all something, some something. So that means this is a categorical syllogism and that is a deductive argument. Argument B, Thomas is not ostentatious. It follows from this that Thomas is unpretentious. Notice that this argument relies purely on the definitions of the words. Because Thomas is not ostentatious, it follows that he's unpretentious. Those mean the same thing. So this argument hinges on the definitions of the words. And this is an argument from definition. That makes it a deductive argument. Argument C. Mount Dana has a height of 13,053 feet and Lambert Dome has a height of 9,450 feet. Interesting enough, I've climbed both of those mountains. Therefore, Mount Dana is 3,603 feet higher than Lambert Dome. This is an argument based on mathematics, right? This is just a math problem. And the conclusion of any math problem is a, or any argument that relies on something like a math problem is an argument based on mathematics and that makes it an, a deductive argument. Let's see what we have here. There were four assignments in the course. Sandra received scores of eight, seven, 10, and nine points out of a possible 10 points per assignment. It follows that Sandra received a total of 34 points toward her grade in the course. This is just an argument based on mathematics. This is just addition, right? So this is argument based on mathematics and this is a deductive argument. So you can see this is another way of deciding, you know, what, what you have, you know, if you can classify an argument as one, fitting into one of these argument patterns, then you'll know that argument is a deductive argument. Let's do the same thing with some inductive argument forms now. 
So remember, we have some common inductive argument forms that we've already talked about. A prediction is inductive because any prediction about the future doesn't have to come into fruition. An argument from analogy, because anytime you're drawing an analogy between two different things, you can always find similarities and you can always find differences. So any argument that hinges on an analogy will be inductive at best. Generalizations, when you draw a conclusion about a large population from a small population or from a small sample size. An argument from authority is when you have um, an expert in a particular field making a claim about his or her area of expertise and you draw a conclusion based on the, on the testimony of an expert or an eyewitness testimony. That's called an argument from authority. An argument based on signs is argument based on written communication, a written message or a visual message of some sort and a causal inference, any kind of reasoning between cause and effect or vice versa. So we, let's look at some examples of each of these kinds of, uh, uh, of arguments. Argument A, a Democratic senator was elected in each of the past senatorial elections. Based on this trend, it is likely that a Democratic senator will be elected during the next senatorial election. So this is a prediction about the future based on something in the past. And because it's a prediction, it's inductive. This is a prediction. Argument B, there are two French restaurants downtown. Since, since one French restaurant offers crepes for a dessert, it is likely that the other French restaurant also serves crepes for dessert. So this is an analogy. We're saying these two restaurants are both French restaurants because one serves crepes. The other one is likely to serve crepes as well. It doesn't necessarily follow that the second one does, but the fact that the two restaurants are similar gives you some reason for thinking so. So this is an argument from analogy. It's saying there are two different things that are similar and the conclusion hinges on that similarity. Argument C. The past several first ladies of the United States had their inaugural gowns custom designed for the inauguration. You can conclude from this that the next first lady of the United States will also have her gown custom designed for the inauguration. This is also a prediction. Based on the past, it's saying something is likely to be true in the future. Argument D, the salesperson at a local computer shop informed me that my new notebook computer comes with a free digital camera. Since the salesperson is familiar with the policies of the shop, it follows that this model of notebook computer is indeed bundled with a free digital camera. This is an argument from authority. We're relying on the testimony of the salesperson here about something in his area of expertise, something at the store. So it's an argument from authority, which makes it an inductive argument. So you'll get some practice on different kinds of deductive and inductive arguments inside the, uh, the homework assignments for, the, for, for this week. Um, again, you can kind of approach these in two ways. You can say, you can ask this very general question, is the reasoning probabilistic or is the reasoning based on necessity? Or you can try to classify these different arguments into one of these argument patterns, both for deductive and inductive arguments. And there'll be questions about both of those during the, uh, the homework exercises you have to do this week. Okay, let's get a little more practice here. Sometimes you can have inductive arguments that participate in more than one form. Like for example, you can have an argument based on mathematics and an argument from definition in the same argument. This is a little down in the weeds, but it's an interesting quirk of you know how these argument patterns work. So let's see here. Um, we've got an argument and uh, this is going to plausibly fulfill two different kinds of inductive argument forms. A sample of 20 freshmen at a particular college indicated that 17 of them will attend the Rolling Stones reunion concert. Consequently, it's unlikely to be false that a majority of the college's freshmen will attend the Rolling Stones reunion concert. <coughs> Excuse me. So first of all, this is a generalization. We're drawing a conclusion about a large number of students based on a sample of them. So this is a generalization. But notice that it's also a prediction. It's making a prediction about what will occur in the future. Both of these are inductive argument forms. So this is definitely an inductive argument, but you could characterize this as a generalization and also rightly characterize this as a prediction. Both of which give you reasons for thinking it's an inductive argument. Okay, moving on. So let's give you a little extra practice with these deductive and inductive argument forms. So we have to decide, what, first of all, whether each argument is deductive or inductive, and then we have to decide which kind of deductive or inductive argument it is. So argument A, a teacher brings 20 apples for her students. Since she has 10 students in her class, 
each student will receive two apples. This is pretty clearly a deductive argument. Why? Because it's an argument based on mathematics. This is basically a math problem. Argument B, Mr. Fields receives a letter from his bank stating that his mortgage payment is overdue. From the letter, it can be concluded that Mr. Fields is behind on his mortgage payment. So this is an inductive argument from the fact that he got a letter saying he's behind on his mortgage uh, payments. It doesn't necessarily follow that, that he's behind. The letter could be mistaken. Maybe it was misprinted, sent to the wrong customer. There's lots of reasons you could think of for thinking that this conclusion doesn't follow with certainty. But the letter gives you some pretty good reason for thinking he's behind on his mortgage payments. This is an inductive argument based on signs, based on written communication. Argument C, no swimmers fear water. Some bathers are swimmers, therefore some bathers do not fear water. If you're savvy, you will notice that this is a categorical syllogism. It's a two premise argument with a conclusion. And we're basically talking about categorical relationships, which kinds of objects belong in which categories. So this is a deductive argument and it is a categorical syllogism. And argument D, if Bonnie drinks coffee, then she's addicted to caffeine. Bonnie does indeed drink coffee, so Bonnie is addicted to caffeine. This is also a syllogism, but notice it's a different kind of syllogism. This is a syllogism that uses an if-then statement as one of its premises. So this is a hypothetical syllogism, which makes it a deductive argument. So you can see, I hope, that even though there are a large number of different types of deductive and inductive arguments to memorize or get familiar with, it's a pretty handy way of indicating what kind of argument you're working with, a deductive argument or an inductive argument. And a little more practice here. Let's do it. Okay, argument A. The interior angles of a triangle must total 180 degrees. Such triangle A has one interior angle of 37 degrees and another of 58 degrees. It follows that triangle A has a third interior angle of 85 degrees. This is also essentially a math problem. So it's a deductive argument and it's an argument based on mathematics. Argument B, at a local record store, a sign next to a particular CD rack indicates that every CD on the rack is on sale for half off. Since I found five CDs that I want to purchase on the rack, it follows that I will get 50% off each CD. This is inductive, right? From the fact that there's a sign saying something, it doesn't necessarily follow that the sign is, is correct. It gives you some reason for thinking it's correct. So this is inductive uh, and it's an argument based on signs. And we have two more examples of different kinds of syllogisms here. Argument C, no koalas are bears, but all polar bears are bears. It follows from this that no koalas are polar bears. This is a deductive argument. And as before, this is a categorical syllogism. It's a syllogism that deals with categorical statements. No something, all something, some something, and so on. And argument D is kind of a lengthy one, but this is also a hypothetical syllogism. If the university had built another parking lot, then a grove of ancient redwood trees would have been cut down. Since it was prohibited for the grove of ancient redwood trees to be cut down, it follows that the university did not build another parking lot. This is a deductive argument, and if you notice, it has two premises, even though they're kind of wordy, a conclusion. One of those premises is an if-then statement, so this is a hypothetical syllogism. So in your, in your homework exercises, you're going to get lots of practice identifying uh, different kinds of arguments classifying them as deductive or inductive and identifying which particular form they are. Okay, and there's one other set of exercises I wanna look at together. Let me get back to the uh, outline and get there and we'll blaze through these last exercises and give you plenty of time to work on your uh, weekly, weekly homework for this week. Okay. Before we dive in to look at the actual exercises, I just wanna give a little reminder. So if you remember from the first part of the video, there are two types of arguments, deductive arguments and inductive arguments. For deductive arguments, there are two relevant terms for evaluating the argument, validity and soundness. A valid argument is one in which the internal reasoning of the argument is correct. That means that if you assume that the premises are true, the conclusion would follow from those premises by necessity. Couldn't be otherwise. 
But that doesn't mean that the argument's a good argument because the premises really do have to be true. So if you have a valid argument, in other words, if the internal reasoning is correct and the premises are actually both all true, then you have what's called a sound de deductive argument. That's the difference between validity and soundness. And there are also two corresponding terms for strength, for, for inductive arguments, strength and cogency. For an inductive argument, if you assume that the premises are true, then if the conclusion probably follows or is likely to follow from those premises, then you have a strong inductive argument. But that still doesn't make the, the argument a good argument. A good argument is one in which you have a, you know, the, 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 the internal reasoning is correct. The conclusion follows from, by likelihood from the, from the premises and the premises are actually true, in which case you have what's known as a cogent inductive argument. And I kind of hate that term. I think it's, it's more confusing than helpful. Uh, and we're going to spend most of this class talking about deductive validity, but I wanted to cover all of these for completion's sake. Let's dive in and do a few examples, and then I will give you your week back to work on the uh, exercises. Let's dive in. So we're talking about deductive validity now. So the question is, if you assume the premises are true, does the conclusion necessarily follow? Let's look at argument A. All elephants are fish and all fish are tigers. Now those statements are false, but if you assume that they're true, if you assume that all elephants were fish, and if you assume that all fish are tigers, would it follow that all elephants are tigers? And in this case, the answer is yes. If all elephants are fish and all the fish are tigers, then all elephants would have to be tigers. This is a valid argument. Now, th this is very, very important. It's like the most important thing I'm going to say during this video. A valid argument doesn't mean that the conclusion is true. That means the internal reasoning of the argument is correct. This argument is valid, but it's not a good argument. It's not a sound argument because the premises aren't actually true. But it's a valid argument. That means the internal reasoning of the argument is correct. If you assume the premises were true, the conclusion would follow by necessity. It's almost a... Uh, a hypothetical or a, a subjunctive way of putting it. If, if the premises were true, then the conclusion would be true. That's how to think about validity. It's the right question to ask. What if, what if the premises were true, would the conclusion follow? Argument B, since Iowa has a larger population than Florida and Florida has a population of only 3,000, it must be the case that Iowa has a population greater than 3,000. <clears> Now, the premises here are false, right? Iowa does not have a larger population than Florida, and Florida doesn't have a population of only 3,000. But what we want to do is start out by assuming that they're true. So let's assume Iowa has a larger population than Florida, and let's assume Florida has only 3,000 people in it. Would it follow that Iowa has a population greater than 3,000? And the answer here is yes. If you assume those premises are true, the conclusion would necessarily follow. Now notice in this case that the, the conclusion is actually true, but that's not what makes it a valid argument. What makes it a valid argument is that the conclusion follows from necessity if you assume that those premises are true. So I wanna make sure you're asking the right questions. You're not concerned yet about whether the conclusion or the premises are actually true. Argument C, since x times y equals 15 and y equals five, it follows that x equals four. Okay, so let's do the little math problem here. If x times y equals 15, if y equals five, x would have to be equal three. It's a very simple division problem. Wouldn't follow that x equals four. So this is an invalid argument. If you assume those premises, that conclusion does not follow an invalid argument. Argument D. Shakespeare was English and Shakespeare was a playwright. Therefore, at least one Englishman was a playwright. Now here, we have an interesting example. Shakespeare was English, that's true. Shakespeare was a playwright, that's true. But we don't care about whether the premises are actually true yet. We wanna ask ourselves, if you assume these premises are true, if Shakespeare were English and Shakespeare was a playwright, would it follow that there's at least one Englishman who was a playwright? And the answer here is yes, that conclusion would follow. So this is a valid argument. So just to recap, with, with validity, you're not concerned about whether the premises of the conclusion are actually true. You wanna ask yourself, what if I assume that those reasons were true, would the conclusion then necessarily follow? And that will make the difference between whether the argument is valid or invalid. Okay, moving on. 
Now remember, a sound argument has to have two components. The argument has to be valid. In other words, the reasoning has to be correct and the premises actually have to be true. And that's what a good deductive argument is. A sound deductive argument is a good deductive argument. So let's see if we have some uh, good arguments here or not. Argument A, if Abraham Lincoln was mortally stabbed in the back, then Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Abraham Lincoln was not stabbed in the back, therefore Abraham Lincoln was not assassinated. So let's see, first thing we wanna ask is if this argument is valid or invalid. So if it's true, if Abraham Lincoln was mortally stabbed in the back, then Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And if we assume Abraham Lincoln was not stabbed in the back, would it follow that Abraham Lincoln was not assassinated? No, it wouldn't follow from that. So that's an invalid argument. <clears throat> and the premises aren't all true, which once you know the argument's invalid, you know that the argument is unsound. So this is an unsound argument because the argument's invalid, whether or not the premises are true. Argument B, notice you really have to think through these. You know, you can't just read these uh, superficially and get the right answers here. You know, you're gonna be forced to think about each of these examples and kind of walk through the reasoning really slowly and carefully when you're doing your exercises. Since Iowa is west of New York and Iowa is west of California, it follows that California is west of New York. So you can kind of do this on a map here, okay? If Iowa is west of New York and Iowa is west of California, would it follow that California is west of New York? And actually it wouldn't follow from the fact that Iowa would be west of both of them. It, it doesn't tell you anything at all about which, which of the other two, New York and California, are west of each other. So this is invalid. Even if those premises were true, that conclusion would not follow. And notice the premises aren't true here. Iowa is west of New York, but Iowa is not west of California. So for both of these reasons, this argument is unsound. It's invalid, it doesn't have all true premises. For an argu argument to be sound, both of these things have to be true. The argument has to be valid and the premises all have to be true. If it fails either one of those criteria, the argument's not sound. Argument C, since the moon orbits the earth every 13 days, it follows that the moon will orbit the earth at least three times every month. Okay, this, is, this is a tricky one to think through. If you assume that the Earth orbits or the Moon orbits the Earth every 13 days, would it necessarily follow that it would orbit the, the Earth at least three times every month? And the answer is no, it wouldn't follow. It wouldn't have enough time to do that in a month. So this is invalid as well. And notice here the premises aren't all true. The Moon does not orbit the Earth every 13 days. So this does not have all true premises. This is unsound. Argument D, all positive whole numbers are rational numbers. Since negative two is a rational number, it follows that it is a positive whole number. Okay, I'll have to use our mathematical knowledge here. If we assume that all positive whole numbers are rational numbers, and we assume that negative two is a rational number, would it follow that it's a positive whole number? And it wouldn't, there's other kinds of rational numbers besides positive whole numbers. So this would be invalid. And here, the, what's interesting is the premises are actually true. All positive whole numbers are rational numbers. Negative two is a rational number. So even though the premises are true, it's not a sound argument because the argument's not valid. The internal reasoning of the argument is not correct. The conclusion doesn't follow from the premises if you assume the premises are true. So just to recap, when you're evaluating an argument for a deductive argument for soundness, you have to ask two things. You first need to ask about the validity. So you ask, would the conclusion follow from the premises if you assume the premises were true? That's the validity. And the premises all have to be true. If it fails either one of those things, you don't have a sound argument. Okay. Let's look at some parallel examples for inductive arguments. So for inductive arguments, remember, there are two key parallel concepts. One is strength, that evaluates the internal reasoning of an inductive argument. In other words, you start out by asking, if you assume the premises are true, would the conclusion likely to be, be likely to be true or, be, or probably be true? If that's the case, you've got a strong inductive argument, but that's still not a good, arg a good, a good de inductive argument. In a good in inductive argument, you also have to have all true premises as well. So let's talk about strength first and foremost. 
So we've got some arguments. We're going to start out by assuming the premises are true and ask whether that makes the conclusion likely to be true. A professor of astronomy at a prestigious university claims that the war in Iraq is likely to be over within six months. Given the professor's qualifications, we should conclude that the war in Iraq is nearly over. A professor in astronomy doesn't make him an expert in, you know, global politics or global wars. So this is a weak argument. That reason, even if it were true, doesn't give you enough evidence to conclude that the conclusion is probably true. Argument B. Harry has always had an aptitude for history, geography, and social sciences, but he's always struggled with abstract concepts such as mathematics and physics. But Harry must take college physics, a college physics course to fulfill a general education requirement for his degree. Based on his academic track record, it's likely that Harry will be one of the top students in his college physics course. Let's see. If we assume, again, we don't know Harry, so we don't know whether this is actually true or false, but if we assume that he's had an aptitude for history, geography, and social sciences, and we assume he's always struggled with abstract concepts, it's not very likely that he's going to be one of the top students in his college physics course. So this is a weak argument. His, uh, the, the, even if you assume the premises were true, that does not give you reason for thinking that the conclusion is likely. Argument C. Most professional baseball games are played in chilly winter weather. So it follows that the next major league baseball game will probably be played in chilly winter weather as well. So the first premise is false, right? Most major, most professional baseball games aren't actually played in the winter. They're played during the summer months. We, we all know that, if, especially if you're a baseball fan, you know that. But if you assume that that's true, assume that baseball occurs in the winter more than in the summer, then it would be likely that the next major league baseball game would be played in in the winter months. So this is a strong argument, even though the premise is false. It's not a good argument, it's not a cogent argument, but it's a strong argument because if you assume the premise is correct, the conclusion would probably follow. Not necessarily, but probably. <clears throat> An argument D. The label on the side of a certain soda can indicates that the can was manufactured by Ball Corporation in their plant in Fairfield, California. Based on the information in the can's label, it is unlikely that the can was manufactured by any other company than Ball Corporation. So here we have an argument based on signs, right? So this is definitely an inductive argument. Let's assume that the premise is true. Let's assume that there's a soda can that says it was manufactured by Ball Corporation in their plant in Fairfield, California. Would it be likely that it wasn't made by anyone else? Yes, it would. The label's probably correct. So this is a strong inductive argument but we don't know whether it's a cogent argument or not because we don't know whether the premise is actually true. But the key thing here about inductive strength is you ask, what if the premises were true? Would that make the conclusion probably true? That holds in this case, so this is a strong inductive argument. Now let's talk about cogency, good inductive arguments. For a good inductive argument, two criteria have to be met. The argument has to be strong. In other words, the internal reasoning of the argument has to be correct and the premises actually have to be true in reality. So let's look at some examples. When Sputnik 2 was launched into space, it carried a Russian dog named Laika, which became the first living mammal to orbit the earth. Since dogs commonly live for more than 10 years, it follows that Laika lived in space for nearly a decade before her death. This one's a little tricky, I think. Let's see, is it strong or weak? If you assume that Sputnik 2 was launched into space and it carried a Russian dog named Laika, uh, who became the first living mammal to orbit the Earth, and since if you assume that dogs commonly live for more than 10 years, would it follow that Laika lived in space for nearly a decade before her death? I don't think so. So this is a weak argument. And of course, um, premises aren't all true in this argument. This is an uncogent argument. Argument B, <clears throat> McDonald's has been in business for decades, but because many towns regularly see businesses open and close, it follows that McDonald's will probably close its door any day now. So let's see, if you assume that McDonald's has been in business for decades, which is easy to assume because it's true, and if you assume that because many towns regularly see businesses open and close, would it follow that McDonald's will probably close its door any day now? That doesn't follow. McDonald's is a more stable company than that. So this is a weak argument. Are the premises all true or not? Let's see, McDonald's has been in business for decades. Many towns do see businesses open and close. 
does have true premises, but it's an uncogent argument because it's not a strong argument. Argument C, email messages and paper letters are both excellent ways to keep in touch with friends and relatives who live a great distance away. Since email messages require postage stamps, it follows that paper letters require postage stamps too. Let's see, is this strong or weak? If you assume that email messages and paper letters are both excellent ways to keep in touch with friends and relatives who live a great distance away, and if you assume that email messages require postage stamps, which is false, but let's assume it's true, would it follow that paper letters require postage stamps too? <clears throat> this is an argument from analogy. So if you do assume those are premises are true, that would be a strong argument. That conclusion would be likely to follow if you assume those premises are true. Now, the, arg the premises aren't all true in this argument. Email messages don't require postage stamps. So this is not a cogent argument. The internal reasoning is correct, but the premises are not all true. So this is an uncogent argument. And argument D, in the United States, it costs more in postage to mail a letter to China than it costs to mail a letter domestically. So since Canada is similarly an overseas country, just like China, it is likely that it also costs more in postage to mail a letter to Canada than it costs to mail a letter domestically. So the first question to ask is, what if you assume the premises were true? Assume it costs more to mail a letter to China than to mail a domestic letter. It's easy to assume because that's actually true. Let's assume Canada is an overseas country. It's not, but let's assume that it is. Would, it, would that make it likely that it costs more to mail a letter Canada, to Canada than it does to mail a letter domestically? And it would make that likely. So this is a strong argument, but not all the premises are true. Can, Canada is not an overseas country. It's on the same continent as us. So it's a strong argument. The internal reasoning is correct, but the re premises or the reasons are not all true. So this is an uncogent argument. So you'll get some practice on this and similar examples in your exercises for the week. Let's do a couple more of examples and I'll let you go. So here we've got some practice arguments. We need to decide whether the argument is deductive or inductive, and we need to apply the right terms, validity, soundness, strength, and cogency, and evaluate the argument all in one fell swoop. So this is like the coup de grace, where you put it all together and you can look at some, some arguments. You don't know what kind of argument they are, and you have to evaluate the arguments. And you'll be asked to do some exercises like this as well in your, in your exercises. The Grand Canyon could not have been made by humans. So it follows that the Grand Canyon was carved out by aliens from Jupiter. This is causal reasoning. Notice that it's, 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 a, a, it's an argument based on cause and effect, right? We have the Grand Canyon and we're kind of reasoning backwards into how the Grand, Grand Canyon came to be. So this is an inductive argument because it relies on causal reasoning, the relationship between cause and effect. So let's now ask whether this is a strong inductive argument or not, or a weak inductive argument. Well, if you assume that the premise is true, if you assume that the Grand Canyon could not have been made by humans, would that make it likely that it was carved out by aliens from Jupiter? And the answer is no, that does not make that likely. So this is a weak inductive argument. And once you know it's weak, it also has to be uncogent because for the argument to be cogent, you have to have a strong argument. Inductive argument because it's causal reasoning, weak argument because the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises and uncogent because the argument's weak. The population sign on the highway leading into Miami, Florida states that Miami has a population of only 100 people. Because of this, we know that Miami is a fairly small town. So this is an argument based on signs. We have some written information here. A sign says the population of Miami. If you assume that, would it follow that Miami would be a fairly small town? And yes, the answer is uh, it would follow from that. Uh, so it's inductive, it's an argument based on signs, and it's a strong inductive argument. Even though the premise is false, if you assume that the premise is true, that conclusion would be likely to be the case based on, on what's written on that sign. But the premises aren't true. The, the population sign leading into Miami doesn't say that Miami has a population of 100 people. So this is uncogent because not all the premises are true. Because walnuts and apples both grow on trees, it follows that people who are allergic to walnuts are also allergic to apples. Well, let's see here. This is an analogy, so this is an inductive argument. 
If you assume that well, walnuts and apples both grow on trees, which they do, so it's easy to assume, would it follow that people who are allergic to walnuts are also allergic to apples? No, it wouldn't follow. People are allergic to all kinds of different things. So this is a weak inductive argument. And once you know it's weak, it has to be uncogent. Okay, let's do a few more examples. Slightly longer examples here. This ancient map of the world clearly indicates the location of Atlantis in relation to other locations in the ancient world. Even though ancient maps are generally less reliable than modern maps, and Atlantis is generally acknowledged to be mythical, if you take your directions from this ancient map, then it is probably true that you will discover Atlantis. This is going to be uh, an argument based on signs because we're talking about written representations, a map. So it's an inductive argument. But it's a weak argument. It's not likely you're going to discover Atlantis because you follow this ancient map. And once you know it's weak, it has to be uncogent as well. Next example. Since there is significantly less oxygen on the top of Mount Everest than at lower elevations, it follows that many mountaineers who attempt to climb Mount Everest bring tanks of oxygen along during their attempts. Well, let's assume the premises are true. Actually, let's, let's classify the argument first. This is deductive or inductive. Um, this is inductive. The conclusion doesn't follow by necessity. This is clearly probabilistic reasoning. If you assume that there's less oxygen on the top of Mount Everest than at lower elevations, would it follow that many mountaineers who attempt to uh, climb Mount Everest bring tanks of oxygen along with them? I would say that's strong. That's probably true. And uh, argument is cogent. In this case, the premise is actually true. There is significantly less oxygen on top of Mount Everest. So that would be cogent. Last example. The Sierra Nevada mountain rains in the island of Jamaica are both popular tourist destinations. Since February is a good month for skiing in the Sierra Nevada region, it follows that if you're traveling to Jamaica in February, then you should bring your ski equipment. So let's see. This is an argument from analogy. We have two different examples of February here. So this is inductive. Um, if you assume that February is a uh, good month for skiing in the Sierra Nevada, and you assume that Sierra Nevada and Jamaica are both popular tourist attractions, would it follow that you should uh, go plan to go skiing in Jamaica in February? The answer is no, that probably doesn't follow. So this is a weak inductive argument and uncogent. Once you know the argument's weak, it has to be uncogent. Okay, so those are all the examples I want to run through. Just a really quick recap at the end of the video here. Every argument has to be made up of statements. Statements are things that are either true or false. In an argument, the premises or the statements that are being used as reasons provide some logical support for thinking that the conclusion is either true or probably true. That's the difference between a deductive and an, and an inductive argument. In a deductive argument, the conclusion is supposed to follow from the premises by necessity couldn't be otherwise. In an inductive argument, the premises or the reasons give you reasons for thinking that the conclusion is just likely to be true or probably true. For each of those arguments, there are two different terms that are relevant. For deductive arguments, you're talking about validity and soundness. For inductive arguments, you're talking about strength and cogency. The very first question to ask, let's talk about deductive arguments first. For deductive arguments, you ask, if the premises were true, would the conclusion absolutely have to be true? And if the answer to that question is yes, you've got a valid argument, whether or not the premises or conclusion are actually true. Once you know the argument's valid, if the premises are also actually true, then the argument is a good argument, what's known as a sound argument, and you know that the conclusion has to be true. Similarly, now there are two terms for inductive arguments, strength and cogency. For an inductive argument, you start out by asking, what if the premises were true? Would that conclusion be likely to be true or probably be true? If the answer to that question is yes, you've got a strong inductive argument. If not, you've got a weak inductive argument. Again, whether or not the premises or conclusion are actually true, that's not the first question you ask. Once you know whether the argument is, is strong, you can then ask, okay, since this argument is strong, are the premises actually true? And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, do you have a strong argument and the premises are true, you've got a cogent inductive argument. In other words, a good inductive argument. And the conclusion is not necessarily true, but probably true or likely to be true.
And again, for the rest of this course, we're going to be talking mainly about deductive arguments and logical validity. And you're going to be introduced to some formal methods for evaluating whether an argument is a deductive argument is deductively valid. But for the for this first week, I want you to get a hold of different kinds of arguments and some of the terminology around them, get some practice distinguishing between arguments, uh, deciding whether arguments are deductive or and inductive arguments, recognizing different kinds of deductive and inductive arguments and evaluating them, getting some practice using the terms validity and soundness and strength and cogency. And you're going to do all of that in your exercises for this first week. And then we're going to shift gears and do some much more math, math, math like formal methods for evaluating deductive validity coming up starting next week. But for now, we're going to be dealing mostly with ordinary language, ordinary language arguments during this first week. But starting very quickly, starting in week two, we're going to be introducing formal ways of representing the structure of logical arguments. And we're going to be doing, you know, formal methods like truth tables and, and, and logic proofs for proving that arguments are, are deductively valued and deductively valid in a, in a formal way. If you have any questions for me, please reach out to me. I know we covered a lot of material. A lot of this is preparatory and preliminary to the rest of the work we're going to do in the class. So if it's a little confusing and overwhelming, that's really okay. But I want you to get some clarity on these terms. So if you have any questions, please contact me. If you're stuck on any exercises, please contact me. Also contact me if you have any questions or concerns about the course as a whole. But again, most importantly, I want you to get a hold of this terminology, get a little bit of practice, but keep in mind that from here we're shifting gears and in week two and moving forward, we're gonna be dealing with much more formal methods for evaluating deductive validity, logic symbols, and a very abstract way of representing um, uh, logical arguments and, and deductive logical arguments. And it, that symbolic, um, more mathematical way of evaluating deductive arguments is really powerful because at a certain point, I think you can see that these very simple examples that we're working with here in week one are a little contrived and a little simplistic. And in reality, deductive arguments are massively more complex than that. In fact, it's the foundation for the way your computer or your mobile device works. And, and the, the logic that you have to deal with for dealing with any kind of technical situation is massively more complex than you get in these simple ordinary language arguments. So formal methods for evaluating deductive validity are, are really important, especially in our technological age. But we're going to talk about all of that next week. In the meantime, this is the end of, end of uh, week one. Uh, please do your exercises and turn in your homework by the end of Sunday um, at the end of week one. I, I set the due date to 11.59 p.m. on Sunday at the end of week one. Uh, please try to keep up with the, with the exercises in this course. Like I said in the, in the welcome video, if you don't keep up with the exercises in the class, this class will snowball faster than any other class you have ever been in and you will not be successful in the class. So please keep up with the exercises. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Otherwise, I hope you have a great week and I will look forward to bringing you the video for week two by Monday of week two. Have a great week.